Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And perhaps you've come to look upon me as the master of the macabre, your escort into the eerie. And in all honesty, I can say that I am happy you have this opinion of me. I'll admit to an affinity for tales of the supernatural and even a sneaking fondness for ghosts. Some ghosts, that is. I cannot say that I have liked every ghost I have met because in my experience, there can be some very unpleasant ghosts like this one. At this moment in time, Jason, I'm a very friendly ghost with warm feelings towards you. Because you're going to do me a favor, Jason. You are going to kill my wife. Did you hear me, Jason? I said you were going to kill Claire. I heard you, and I say you're a murderer. I'm not a murderer. You Ah. will kill her, Jason. Ah. Because this is just a sample of what can happen to Ah. you. When my feelings become unfriendly. mystery drama, Voices of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Mandel Kramer and Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. many stories about faceless voices that speak to lonely people. Voices that come from nowhere, that threaten, cajole, terrify, or madden the mortals who hear them. Our story is about such a voice, but it is a voice that has a face, the face of a dead man. Most of us know what to expect when we turn on a television set. But the last thing Jason Phillips expected was to have the face of a dead man appear on his television tube. How did the face of Peter Truro get on my TV screen? Peter, I'm sure if you were alive, you'd understand why yours is the last face I'd want to look at. So forgive me for switching stations. What is this, Peter, again? I'll try another channel. On every channel? Peter Truro? That's ridiculous. And no sound. What's wrong with the sound? Nothing, Jason. What? This isn't the normal way to return. I'm seeing things. And hearing them. Peter Truro is dead and buried. He couldn't be talking to me from my TV screen. Everything... Everything happened so suddenly with Peter and Claire and that lousy Lindilla. Put the TV back on. Relax, Jason. I'm not a delusion. I realize that my talking to you this way must be quite a shock, but uh, you're really seeing and talking with Peter Truro. Oh, sure. Sure. Peter Truro, who's been dead and cremated for ten days. The body, yes, Jason, but uh, nothing else. Now, just as soon as we complete our business, you'll be rid of me. And you'll be happy. You keep talking about business, What kind of business can we have? You're going to do a little job for me, Jason. You're going to kill my wife. There's absolutely no point in your turning off the television, Jason. You're a fraud, Peter. I don't know how you got into my set, but you're a fraud. Oh, come on now. You're not going to claim that you're still upset because, after all, I am a ghost? Well, of course. It's a perfectly natural occurrence, isn't it? Everyone who watches television sooner or later finds himself face-to-face and talking with a ghost every time he turns on his set. What you're really telling me is that you're afraid I'm not a ghost at all, but a figment of your imagination. And you find that strange. You don't think that that's enough to upset me? Of course. Of course it is, Jason. Like Hamlet, you're wondering about your brain. Yes, I am. Well, I can take that worry off your shoulders. Oh. Suppose Claire comes to see you. Claire? What would she want? An attack of conscience. Guilt. Whatever you may want to call it. 
But, Jason, I will make Claire visit you. And then we will talk again. What in the world am I doing here, anyway? Can you tell me, Jason? Putting on a marvelous act, as usual, Claire. (sighs) Why do I feel cold? Why do I have this feeling that Peter's watching? (laughs) Which question would you like me to answer? Do you believe in ghosts? Of course not. You sound so sure. So very. And you're not. I remember how you used to make fun of the whole spiritual scene. I said it was impossible. Claire, why this discussion? What made you phone me and come here to talk about... I've been having dreams. Dreams? Well, I'm no psychiatrist. Yes, dreams about Peter. He keeps telling me to come to you and explain about... What do you know? How you lost the part in the play and... I'm not making very much sense, am I? No, you're not. I don't know why you came here, but I know damn well you'd better leave. Are you convinced, Jason? Do you believe now that I'm a ghost? Well, you heard Claire. You know I sent her to you. So she says. I don't know whether it was smart to throw her out so abruptly. She may become suspicious. About what? About your wanting to kill her. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. Remember how you felt when Claire told you that she was replacing you in the part that I had picked for you in Cries of Descent? Remember how you raged because you knew that Claire was throwing you out, not because of your lack of ability, but because she wanted the part for her lover, Edward Linville. You even threatened to kill her. I don't have to listen to any more of this. Right now, I could cheerfully have murdered you if you'd been alive. Hello. Jason, this is Claire. Darling, I do think you owe me some sort of explanation for almost throwing me out of your place a while ago. Claire, my love, the only thing I owe you is a punch in the mouth, and if you were a man, I'd be happy to give it to you. Are you going to be with us long, Mr. Phillips? Well, that depends. You'll find all sports and great weather at the Clarkstown Inn. Uh, You will be in uh, 445. If there's anything you want, don't hesitate to ask. Now, before I call a leader, I think I'd better see if Peter is still with me. Here I am, Jason. You didn't think you could run away from me, did you? I wasn't sure, but I was hoping. I'm curious about one thing. Why did you pick this godforsaken little town as a place of refuge? Because I happen to have been born right here in Clarkstown. Ah. Then this is an attempt to recapture the safety of your childhood. That's very touching, Jason. I've had enough of you tonight, Peter. Time for me to do what I came here for in the first place. Talk to an old friend. Hello? Alita. After all these years. And it is a pleasure to hear yours, Jason. Oh, Alita, you're too much. After all these years, you hear me say your name and immediately you know my voice. It is a distinctive voice, Jason. Are you calling from New York? No, I'm at the inn right here in Clarkstown. Matter of fact, I came here just to see you. How nice. But, Jason, there's been a lot of years since we last spoke. And right now it's almost past my bedtime. How about breakfast with me tomorrow? More coffee, Jason. No, thanks, Alita. Alita, I'm being haunted. I think I'm going crazy. I don't know where to turn or what to do. That's why I came to see you. Do you think you can help me? If you'll calm down, maybe. Well, you just don't know what it's like. And I can't find out unless you tell me. Do you know this ghost? Of course. It's the famous Broadway producer, Peter Truro. Hmm. I read about his death. It was only a short time ago. That's right. And he's been after me for the past two weeks. How does this haunting manifest itself? Through television. Mm -hmm. Every time I turn on the TV set, it's Peter's face that appears. I can't get any other programs, just Peter Truro. Mm. What does he say to you? Well, that's what's got me scared. He's asking me to kill his wife. (gasps) What frightened you, Alita? Why? (sighs) Well... Jason, as I remember you, when you were a boy, you were not particularly psychic or 
even sympathetic to psychic phenomena. That's right. In order to help you, I must find out why the ghost of Peter Truro chose you as his instrument in the first place. Can you? I can try. But not this morning. Can you come back tonight for another seance? Like the one you remembered as a boy. That's why I came. I'll be here, Alita. I can't promise anything will come out of this. I can't even promise to make contact. But if I do, you will have to keep absolutely quiet. Understand? Yes. Yes, I do. All right. Now, hold my hands. Tighter. The light is too bright. It hurts my eyes. I can't see. Ah. Better, yes. That's better. Now, I see. I see you quite clearly. Jason. Jason, why did you do this? Just when we two were getting along so well, you went and brought this stranger in. Well, Peter, I... Jason, you must keep... You promised. Let him talk for himself. We have some wonderful chats when we're alone. Jason is a friend of mine. He has asked my help. Why did you choose him to torment? It is I who am in torment. You must know that. It is I who cannot rest until a vow has been kept. What vow? The marriage vow. Has it not been kept? Did you not plight love till death do us part? No. Our vow was to remain faithful and loving forever. We changed the marriage ceremony. And the vow has not been kept. And I seek revenge. I will have revenge. I will. Uh, 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 Alita. Uh, Alita, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I will be fine. Just give me a moment. Are you sure you're going to be all right? Yes, I... I'm sure about me. But I'm worried about you, Jason. I am not sure about you. Ghosts are very much like UFOs. People say they don't exist. But somehow the idea of ghosts and UFOs just won't go away. The question of whether ghosts can have anything to do with dreams is one that has occupied the thoughts of psychics since people first began to talk about ghosts. Jason Phillips was haunted by a ghost. Not in his dreams, but one who took over his TV set. Jason is seeking help. Not from an analyst, but from an old and respected medium whom he had known since childhood. All right, all right, Alita. I don't mean to start a discussion. All I want to know is how do I get rid of the ghost of Peter Truro? I wish I could tell you. You mean I can't get any help? I'll have to spend the rest of my life listening to Peter insisting that I kill Claire for him? You can turn off your television, can't you? Oh, great. I'll never look at a TV set again. Is that your solution? How deeply was Peter devoted to his wife? What kind of question is that? A very important question. Well, there was a jealousy act that Peter was putting on. What made you think it was, as you put it, an act? Because nobody could have been that jealous. What about the relationship? Was it a good one? I don't know. I never stopped to think about it. There was the difference in age. I mean, Peter was some 18 years older than Claire, and he was Broadway's outstanding producer, and she was an actress. Are you trying to say that Claire married Truro to advance her career? That she didn't love him? Well, there was no question that Truro worshipped Claire, that he'd do anything for her. She liked Peter, but... Well, I think the feeling was deeper on his side than hers. And how did you feel about Claire? Alita, I don't see the point of all this. Ghosts do not choose people to haunt unless by design. In order even to begin to help you, we must try to find out why Peter Truro 
chose you as an instrument for his vengeance. How do you feel about Claire? Well, I'm certainly not fond of her. After all, she was responsible for my losing the part in Cries of Descent. You wanted to kill her. Don't be ridiculous. You sound just like Peter. You won't admit it to yourself. But you're secretly delighted with the idea of punishing Claire Truro. And there is no way you can get rid of Peter Truro until you do. Welcome home, Jason. So nice to be back with you. Cut it, Peter. I liked your friend Alida. Oh, I'm glad. Well, now that your investigation has proved that I'm really a ghost and not something your imagination cooked up, we can get down to specifics about killing Claire. Now, let's get this straight. I evidently can't stop you from appearing on my TV screen. But I am not going to kill anyone. Not even Claire. I'll show you how you can get away with it. I'm not interested. What can you lose by sitting down and picking up a piece of paper and a pen? No, no. Admit you're curious. All right, I'm curious. Oh, come on, Jason. You know we both burn for revenge. You because Claire fired you from cries of dissent to replace you with her lover, Edward Linville. Who is awful. Have you seen him? Oh, I don't have to. I know he's terrible. But he's playing the part. And he's sleeping with my wife. So, uh, get the paper and pen, eh? All right. Now, write the following. My darling... This should not come as a surprise since we talked about your unfaithfulness. Now, wait a minute, Peter. There's not much more. Unfaithfulness many times. And you know that I said I would kill you. My dearest, prepare to die. And sign it, Peter. What do you think she'll say when she finds that in her desk drawer? Hmm? Well, I think she'll laugh because she'll know it's an obvious forgery. Well, take another look, Jason. And then tell me if you recognize the writing. What? How did you do it? This is your handwriting. <laughs> Make me look again. Darling, you must. This thing has gone too far for you to give in to it now. Now, please open the drawer. What if I find another of those horrible notes? You won't find any more. I've had the only key to the drawer in my pocket for the past two days. Oh, can't we just let it go for now? Open the drawer. Now, here's the key, darling. <gasps> what was it? Well, that's impossible. Let me see. No, don't. It's impossible, you said. Impossible. All right, Edward, read what it says. Read it. Tell me it's impossible. I think we should go to the police. And tell them what? That you're getting notes from a dead man? Well, haven't you been telling me all along that that was impossible? Of course I have. Then we can go to the police. And tell him that some vicious, practical joker is blackmailing me. He hasn't asked for anything. Oh, he's building up to it. I know he's building up to it. Who is he? That's the big question. Who is doing this and how? I'll swear that the notes are in Peter's handwriting. And any handwriting expert will swear to the same thing. Then maybe we should ask the police to begin looking for a master forger? I thought you said we shouldn't go to the police. I have an idea. Now, it may be crazy, and, and I don't know whether or not it'll help, but it's an idea. I'll do anything, anything to stop this mountain. Well, maybe we should find a spiritualist and have a consultation. Who is it? Ed Linville. Well, if I say I'm surprised, I'm sure you'll understand. Completely. I'm sure that you'll understand that I wouldn't be here in your apartment unless I thought it was very important. Granted. I'm here because I can't help feeling there's some connection between you and some crazy notes Claire's been getting. Notes? 
Don't think I understand. Uh, somebody has started a systematic campaign of persecution against Claire. Well, why don't you go to the police? Because I'm afraid of the publicity. Claire will look silly because the persecution is seemingly directed by Peter Truro. Well, she can't be serious. How could Peter... That's possibly... what everyone's reaction is, because I can't explain the notes. That's the second time you've mentioned notes. They're vicious, handwritten little jottings. All reminding her of some silly vows that she had made with Truro before they were married. And they threaten her life. They're all signed by Peter Truro. Well, it's impossible. That's what I said. Claire insists that the handwriting is Peter's. It's been checked by three handwriting experts. All three say Claire's right. The handwriting is Peter's. Well, that still doesn't explain what brings you here to see me. I told you, Claire's sense there's a connection. She told me she came to see you. Yes, she did. And she told me you behaved rather strangely. Look, I know you're worried about Claire, so I'm giving you a lot of latitude, but you're really beginning to annoy me, Linville. I'm just trying to find out why you got so angry with her when she was only talking about her dreams. She came here, I thought, to ask my forgiveness for the raw deal she gave me in cries of dissent. A deal which you were part of. Now, why should I sympathize with Claire and her problems? We were never that close before Peter died. And as far as you're concerned... Can you forget that I replaced you? You don't have a right to ask me to forget. Oh, yes, I have. And I'm going to get some answers or the cops are going to get some information. Even if it means bad publicity. The cops? Claire and I went to a medium. We showed her the notes. We told her all we knew. She held a seance and she came up with your name. And that's what you're going to tell the cops? That and the fact that you're mad because I replaced you in cries of dissent. You've had this coming and now you're going to get... I'll kill you, so help me, I'll kill you. So, Jason... We made quite a spectacle of ourselves with Edward Linville, didn't we? How did that medium get my name? She must have been extraordinarily perceptive. You know that it was a she. You're in on this. Oh, really, Jason, you're becoming paranoid. Since I'm obviously depending on you to kill Claire for me, it would be extraordinarily stupid for me to have you suspected even before the crime. Nobody is going to be suspected because there isn't going to be any crime. Oh, your adrenaline's still working overtime because of that scrap with Linville. When you calm down, you'll realize what a fool you're making of yourself. No need to remind me. I realized that the minute Linville said he'd been given my name. What story can Linville take to the police? He can accuse me of writing poison pen letters to Claire. He can? On what evidence? The word of a medium? According to Linville himself, Claire had the notes checked with a handwriting expert who swore that the handwriting was mine. Now, how does that point to you? <sighs> Why can't you leave me alone? Oh, come, Jason... You were having a ball with the notes and watching the effect they had on Claire? All right, I'll admit that, but writing nasty little notes is a lot different than killing. Well, of course it is. And you want me to guarantee that no one will ever connect you with the killing. That's what you really want, isn't it, Jason? <sighs> Look, you're too smug for me to argue with. There's no point in any further discussion, so... Now, now, hold on a minute, Jason, hold on. I want to tell you how I can guarantee your being in the clear. Like promising me you won't give the police my name. I offer you complete safety. How? A suicide note. Suicide? Exactly. Claire will commit suicide. Take an overdose of sleeping pills and leave a completely authentic suicide note to prove it. You mean you're really going to drive Claire to suicide? Don't you think Claire is the suicidal type? No. I agree. That's why we must have the note. Do you want to write it now? Are you out of your mind? Just write what I dictate. No way. We are going to say that she just couldn't stand the idea of betraying me and breaking her solemn marriage vow. Now, you're not going to mention me, are you? Well, of course not. Somebody will remember that the earlier notes dealt with me and Linville. That's why we'll just stick with her guilt about betraying me. You see how careful I'm being about involving you? Yes, but you want me to write the note. You must. I guarantee the handwriting experts will all swear the handwriting is genuine. In addition, it will be on her special stationery, of course. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to arrange that? 
You are. You are going to be invited to a party. A bash that Claire will be giving next week. And while you're there, I'll arrange to show you the room where Claire keeps her stationery. And the desk. Oh, forget it. Haven't you ever heard of fingerprints? Mine will be all over the place. Pick it up, Jason. That's Claire calling with your invitation. Congratulations, Jason. You accepted Claire's invitation with just the right amount of reluctance. How did you know that Claire would call? Oh, you must grant me certain ghostly secrets of the trade. It should reassure you about our chances of pulling off a successful murder. I thought you said suicide. Yes, I did. But to be quite accurate, I should have said apparent suicide. We both agreed that Claire wasn't a suicidal type. Then what was all that talk about sleeping pills in a suicide note? Just talk? By no means. Well, she's not going to take an overdose of her own free will. That is where you come in, Jason. You'll have to see to it that she takes them. We'll work that out somehow. The devil we will. This is where I get off, Peter. I'm finishing with you once and for all, even if I have to smash the set. We're past that, Jason, old boy. What? Wait a minute. The set's off. I hear you. Why can't I see you? Of course the set is off, Jason. But now we have such a close relationship that I don't have to depend on a mechanical device to communicate with you. From now on, Jason, I'm your friend and faithful companion. <laughs> Who was it who first said, with a friend like that, who needs enemies? Oh, well, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that a ghostly voice has taken control of Jason Phillips. All of us are driven sometimes by forces we don't clearly see or understand. But how many of you have ever obeyed the commands of a ghost? And what happened when you did? Don't answer that. People who hear voices either tell no one or lay themselves open to all sorts of risks, not the least of which is ending up on a couch. Actor Jason Phillips has been hearing the same voice for weeks, a voice of a Broadway producer who keeps urging Jason to kill the producer's actress wife. Jason is now disturbed enough to seek help from a distinguished and brilliant psychiatrist. The whole purpose of our talks, Jason, depends on your deciding what is important. Now, obviously, your losing the part in Cries of Descent was a real shock to you. Well, it would be to anybody. Of course, but what about Claire Truro? What was your relationship with her before that? It was friendly, casual. I mean, after all, she was Peter's wife, and he made no bones about how he felt about her. Were you attracted to her? She's a very good-looking woman. That's not what I asked. Oh, I guess maybe, but nothing earth-shaking. And how did she feel about you? I don't know. I mean, I... I think it might be wise if you could recreate the day she told you she was replacing you in cries of dissent. Well, I don't know if I can remember all of it. I, uh, I came to the theater that day about the same time as usual... Rehearsal was scheduled for 11. I got there about 10.50. I was sitting in my dressing room when I heard a knock on the door. Come in. I'm glad you're early, Jason. There's something I want to talk to you about. Fine. Well, I need the script. No. Jason, darling, this isn't going to be very pleasant. Well, the last few weeks haven't been very pleasant. This is something I know is going to hurt you, and I wish... How I wish... You're not making sense. I've never done this before. I've never fired an actor before. Fired an act? You mean I'm out of the play? I'm afraid so. But why? Why? You know I'm good in the part. You know what the part means to me. Why would... I think you're beginning to understand. Believe me, Jason, I... Does Linville mean that much to you? Well, you knew I... I was... knew you were seeing a lot of him, but I didn't think that... 
Well, isn't this very sudden? Peter's only been dead a few days. Edward Linville and I... Well, we go back a long way. Claire, I don't want to hear any stories of old love affairs. It's not going to make me feel any differently about the kind of deal you're giving me. I don't suppose I could expect you to feel any other way. Come off it, Claire. You cut my heart out and you want to be forgiven? You'll get your full salary for the run of the I don't need it. I'll take my two weeks notice. I'll be in touch with your agent. Goodbye, Jason. And that's about the way it was, Doctor. Well, a traumatic experience. It has left a deep scar. Well, I knew that before I came to you. Now help me. Well, the help must come from within you. You don't believe in this ghost of mine. Do you? We keep going around in circles, Doctor. Not quite. The first day you came to me, you wanted to know whether or not you could actually hear a voice and be perfectly sane. You remember I gave you an answer. Yes, you said it was possible. And then? And then I told you the voice I heard belonged to a dead man and asked if you believed in ghosts. And do you remember my answer? Yes, you said, for some people, ghosts are a way of life. That's right. Doesn't that apply to you? No, and I don't know anyone it does apply to. Doctor, if you're trying to confuse me, you're doing a great job. I'm trying to lead you to a conclusion. You'd only kill someone who did you harm? Does that seem so strange? Someone like... Claire Truro. Oh, there you go again, Doctor, trying to prove something. Prove what? That I'd really like to kill Claire. Wouldn't you? Yes. Yes, I would. I'd like to get my hands around her throat. Yes, I want to kill her. What in the world have you done, Jason? Made a purchase, Peter. A mannequin. Don't you recognize her? Should I? Well, she's a lady very close to your heart. To me, she just looks like any other window dummy they use in dress shops. Ah, oh, but this one is different, Peter. Don't you recognize your beloved wife, Claire? What kind of foolishness is this? Expensive made-to-order therapy for a man who talks to ghosts. A ghost who wants him to kill his wife. Now, I prop Claire up here in the corner of this couch, and I hit her. And I hit her again, and again, and again. You feel better? Much better, Peter. You see, I'm willing to admit to you now that I am aggressive towards Claire and I would like to see her dead. That is progress. That's what my doctor says. Now that I've admitted the terrible thought and acknowledged it, I can get rid of my aggression. By hitting that department store dummy on the head? You go ahead and laugh. But it's going to work. <laughs> And over here. Oh, great party, Claire. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I want you and Edward to shake hands right here and now. Oh, of course. Go on, Edward. Go on, shake hands. Well, I think I made a fool of myself, Jason. Well, you don't have a monopoly on foolishness. I kind of lost my head, too. Well, it's all over now. And even though Edward said I shouldn't, I have to ask a favor, Jason. Go right ahead. Well, you know that little church around the corner from your apartment? You mean St. Anthony's? Mm -hmm, that's it. They have a theatrical about this time every year, and I've known Father Kinsolving for years and years, and... Well, I... I always donate some costumes. I was wondering if you'd be kind enough to drop them off for me. No trouble at all. I'd be happy to. You see, Edward, what you called my silly brainstorm turned out to be not such a bad idea at all. <laughs> Come home, Jason. Did you enjoy the party? Matter of fact, I had a ball. I see you have the clothes with which you can dress that ridiculous dummy, so it looks even more like Claire. These are costumes that I have to give to St. Anthony's. Well, try one of them on the dummy. You'll find it will make your therapy more effective. Go on. I like that blue dress. Wait a minute. Did you have anything to do with this? Of course, I put the idea into Claire's head of asking you to deliver the costumes. I think it's going to please me to see a more lifelike Claire in your living room. And give you a good deal more of satisfaction. All right, Doctor, and I'll admit I do feel better. But all that pummeling and smashing at the model of Claire hasn't stopped me from hearing Peter's voice. Do you also see him? Only when I turn on the TV. I don't bother with that anymore. But I am still confused. You and I have these long conversations and... 
you were about to say. Well, I don't know. I, um... There are too many things that can't be explained away because of my aggressiveness. Those notes and the fact that they were judged to be in Peter's handwriting. Which you've often seen enough on checks and letters. I'm not that good a forger. All right, Jason. What is the alternative? <sighs> I don't understand. We've come a long way since you first came here. Let's assume that you didn't forge the notes. You know who wrote them, but someone else dictated them. And the same person guided your hand. Now, who could that person possibly be? I've been telling you, the ghost of Peter Truro. And this same ghost influenced his wife to give you costumes to deliver to a church or a theatrical. He says he did. This, then, is the alternative you must face. That there is a ghost. That he is the ghost of Peter Truro... And that he is haunting you. And that I believe in that ghost? Don't you? I'm afraid I don't have any choice. Who is it? Alida. Oh, come in. Thank you for coming so soon after I called. I'd never forgive myself if I hadn't. Who's that? It's just a dummy dressed in Claire's clothes. You must get rid of it. Well, I will, but I asked you to visit with me. Get rid of it now. What do you want me to do, throw it out the window? It doesn't matter. Don't you realize how dangerous it is for you to have her here? Oh, come on, Alita. It was my doctor's idea. He said I could use the dummy to take out my aggressions. Indeed. And where did you get the clothes? Claire gave them to me. Does she know how you're using them? She gave me a lot of stuff to give to a church theatrical. I kept this one dress out. Are you so friendly that she would ask you to do her a favor like that? Look, I'm afraid I've gone as far as I can with the doctor. He feels that it's all my subconscious. My urge to kill Claire that accounts for everything. Your wish to kill Claire does not mean there are no ghosts. There is evil all around you. Either you or Claire must leave New York. I don't see how running away will get rid of Peter. I'm not so much concerned now with your getting rid of Peter as I am with saving your life. You really mean that, don't you? You're really frightened. There was only one other time in my life when I'd been this frightened. When was that? No. No. Now, Jason, please come away with me. Come back with me to Clarkstown until... Until? Until the restless thirst for revenge has left the ghost of Peter Truro. <laughs> You were sensational tonight, Claire, my love. Thank you, Edward. Shall we eat something before we go home? No, no, I'll meet you at the house. I have to go someplace first. Oh, very mysterious. Well, it, it, it's important. You care to tell me? I'm afraid you disapprove. Well, if it's what I think it is, I certainly will do more than disapprove. Oh, be a darling and don't ask any questions. I'll tell you all about it when I get home. Now, Claire, I'm not going to... I have to get gonna... this makeup off, and I... You're not going. Now, don't be silly, Edward. You don't even know where I'm going. Stop treating me like a child, Claire. It's obvious that you're taking that last note seriously. I want these notes to end. I want this whole situation to end. Can you promise me that you can stop it, Edward? No, but... So no... This last note says I'll have all the answers if I go alone... To Jason's apartment. And you believe that? He also that? says I'll find the door open. I'm going there. And if the door's open, I'll go in. But Claire, you, you know can't... where I'll be. And if I'm not home in an hour, you can come after me. Call the police or do anything you want. Oh, darn, I just remembered something, Alita. What? I left something important in the apartment. Oh, but Jason, our bus leaves in half an hour. You promised to go home with There's me. There's plenty of time. My apartment's only a short distance. I'll grab a cab be back in plenty of time. Meet you at gate number five. You're doing the right thing, Jason. I promise a stunning surprise awaits you in your apartment. And after tonight, it will be all Cap. over. Cap! You'll like what I've done with the mannequin, Jason. That's a promise. The door is open. That part of the note is right. Jason? Jason, are you home? Oh, darn. Oh, where are the lights? Oh, oh. oh it's this. Jason, you're not playing some silly game, are you? Oh. Oh, a 
me. Some kind of store figure. Jason, whatever you're up to, get this thing away from me. It's just where a dummy belongs, on the floor. Jason, I'm too old to be afraid of the dark. I'll, I'll just sit and wait for you. And if you don't come soon, Edward will be here. I'm warning you. Oh, I thought mentioning Edward would do it. Switch on the light, Jason. <laughs> oh, Peter, this is what your surprise is. You've made the mannequin talk. Marvelous, Peter. Who are you talking to, Jason? <laughs> Please turn on the light. Thank you, Peter. This is really wonderful. <laughs> Jason, are you mad? And the throat feels like real flesh. My hands are closing around real flesh. I don't know how you did it, Peter. Jason, you're killing me. Jason, <laughs> That finishes you once and for all. Now, a little light. Clear. Clear. It's really clear. Of course, Jason. I've kept my promise and you've done the job. Now you're rid of me forever. Goodbye. Jason? Claire. Claire, I've really killed you. No. No. Oh, no. Well, that's one way to rid yourself of a ghost. Jason Phillips was no longer haunted. However, I certainly don't recommend it as a general rule. I do recommend, however, a more generous suspension of disbelief when someone tells you he's seen a ghost or is hearing voices he can't explain. Voices. Voices we hear only inside our own heads. Sometimes... We identify them as voices of conscience, and everyone accepts the fact that we hear those. But ghostly voices, the voices of the dead, how real are they? Just as real as our imagination allows them to be. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Ralph Bell, E.V. Juster, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division, the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and new sugar-free diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Once again, to the shadow world of mystery and suspense, to a dark and cryptic universe called the imagination. When we were young, we liked to believe there are things money cannot buy. You know, things like love, happiness. But as we grow older and learn more about the world, well, we're not so sure. As a matter of fact, Many of us even begin to believe that the only thing money cannot buy is a fresh new body and a chance to live another lifetime. 
Well, don't be too sure of that. What happened? Is he dead? Oh, he's an old man. I don't know why. Here he comes. Okay, okay, now break it up. Give him air. Hey, Miller, bring me a blanket. Call for an ambulance. Oh, for sure. Maybe, maybe. Help me. All right, all right. Take it easy. Take it easy, Pop. You're going to be okay. I've been robbed. Officer, I've been robbed. All right, now just keep calm, Pop. I've been robbed. All right, all right. What was taken? What was taken? Can't can, can you see what was taken? No, Pop, I can't. What did they take? They, they, he took my body. He, he took what? He took my body. No, 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 no. Look, he didn't, Pop. You still got your body. Can't you understand? He took my body. My young body. And he left me this one. I want my own body back. I want my no, own Pop, look, body. You just relax. I see, relax. Don't look at me as if I was crazy. Of course not, Pop. And don't call me Pop. I'm younger than you are. <laughs> mystery drama, The Forever Man, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. our great religions agree on one important point. The soul leaves the body after death. However, from time to time, the question has been raised, can the soul leave before the body dies? Philosophers have considered the point, and as usual in these matters, have reached no consensus of opinion. Actually, they have found it difficult to define just exactly what the soul is. Well, we're about to meet a young man named Jackson Hanley, who will soon become intimately concerned with the problem, even though no one has ever accused him of being a philosopher. He has, however, often been accused of other things, which is why our story opens in what is a rather familiar locale for Jack Hanley, a police station. Well, if it isn't an old and reliable customer, Jack Hanley, the cop fighter himself... Uh, why don't you just count the tiles on the ceiling, Jack? I'll be with you in a minute. Sergeant Burns here. Oh, hiya, sweetheart. Nothing, nothing. I just have to dispose of an old client. Yeah, he can wait. What's with Junior? He did. <laughs> he said, Daddy, uh, I told you he was a genius. No, oh, sure, me darling. You can always call me up with news like that. That's right. Goodbye. Ah, well, Jack, Jack... What are we going to do with you? I guess I'm just a bad boy, Sarge. Why do you fight with cops, Jack? I don't like to get pushed around. Well, there's no percentage in it. Yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, you can't win. So what? All you do is wind up in a cell with a black eye and uh, a fat lip. <laughs> Look, maybe there's a law that says I got to go to the cooler. But is there a law that says I got to listen to you? <laughs> Jack, I got great news for you. Yeah, like what? Take a real wild guess, Jack. Okay. Somebody came along and posted bond. That's right. What's right? Somebody came along and posted bond. What are you talking about? You guessed it. <laughs> are you kidding? No. It's on the level. But who posted bond for me? I don't know. Maybe you got a fairy godmother. You mean I can just walk out of here? There's the door. Take off. That's all there is to it? That's all. You mean you ain't even going to give me the speech? Oh, Jack, on your way, will you? I don't have all day to fool around with every hood that's hauled in here. Ah, Mr. Henley. Who are you? How do you do? My name is Fraser, Leroy Fraser. Yeah? What can I do for you? Not nearly as much as I can do for you. How do you know my name? Oh, I know quite a bit about you, Mr. Henley. Yeah? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, I posted bond for you this morning. Oh. Why? Would you believe I'm a wealthy old man who likes to do good deeds? No. Then why do you suppose I did it? You want something? Excellent. You, Mr. Henley, are a realist. No illusions. 
exactly the man I'm looking for. To do what? First, you take me somewhere. You drive a car. Oh, but of course you do. You even race cars when you can. I'm parked at the curb. That, that imported sports job? That's yours? It's one of mine. One of my cheaper cars, I might add. Gee, I never saw one like that outside of a magazine. Are you afraid to drive it? Hand over the keys. Where to? Not far, the Pershing Arm. Hey, that's a pretty classy joint. I find it adequate. Why'd you post my bond? You already know I want something. What? Let us say my share of eternity. <laughs> what does that mean? Are you willing to take a job? Doing what? For one thing, you drive this car. Chauffeur, that's a drag. The car will be yours. Mine? you need it to get around. Where would I be going? You'll find out after lunch. Why not now? It's a long story. Yeah. Listen, Mr. Fraser, I better straighten you out. Please do. I, uh... You see, I'm a guy who gets into trouble. I know. Yeah, it's because, well, maybe I got a bad temper, you see. A rather low boiling point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, so, well, I get into fights, I get arrested. I'm aware of that. But I'm not a crook. You understand? I understand perfectly. Yeah, so, this thing, uh, well, it better not be something I could go to jail for. Jack, I assure you, it's a pure and simple out-and-out private business agreement. But to do what? Something that is mutually profitable. Well, what is that? Ah, pull over. Oh. We're at the Pershing Arms. Uh-huh. What's here? Your apartment. My apartment? All ready and waiting. <laughs> The place is satisfactory. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, come over here and look. What a magnificent view of the park. Yeah, but hold on. We got some things In to the straight... kitchen, the freezer's stocked with steak. Yeah, that's fine, but listen. A listen, splendid uh... hi-fi and stereo. Mm. A liquor cabinet. Sure, that's all very nice, Fraser, but... Uh, but... but what, Jack? What is all this about? I promise to tell you after lunch. Well, why do I have to wait? I'll see you at my place at three o'clock. Hey, well, now, wait a minute. Where are you going? I to wanna... my apartment. I have a duplex down the hall. I thought we were going to have lunch. I always eat alone. Oh, oh uh, I'd forgotten. Huh? You'll need money. Money? For expenses. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, what, what, what kind of expenses? 300 should see you through the next couple of days. 300? Uh, well, I... Uh, On second thought, let's be safe and make it five. Five. To see. 50, 100, two, three, four, and 500. There you are. Enjoy lunch. Well, Mr. Fraser, I gotta know what I'm getting into. Is it, uh... Is it bad so far? How'd you like the pad, huh? What's the catch? Nothing. Jack, you're talking to me, Della, remember? Well, there's this guy. Which guy? An old guy, Mr. Fraser. He puts up my barn. Why? I don't know. He gives me the car. Why? I don't know. And he gives me a job. Doing what? I don't know. He even gives me 500 in advance. Oh, I don't like it. But you're always on to me to get a job. Okay, I got a job. A job, sure, but something like this? Jack, it has to be a setup. What kind of setup? I don't know. That's what's wrong. You see, we both keep saying, I don't know. You don't know what the job is, and I don't know why I don't like it. Look, Della, I figure it this way. No, Jack, don't you figure. Figuring always gets you into trouble. But you have to figure he's an old nut, right? And he's out to throw his dough away for kicks. 
So why shouldn't I catch some of it? I still don't like it. You mean there are no old nuts like him? It don't happen? Oh, in storybooks, maybe. In the movies, maybe. Oh, Jack. Jack, listen to me. You're 500 ahead. Now, let's get out of here right now. Ella, this is a gold mine. You think so? And this 500, that's just what's lying around on the top. Oh, Jack, I'm scared. Of what? I, I can't explain it. I'm just scared, that's all. Look, I can handle it. Oh, sure. Sure, I know how you can handle it. The way you think you can handle everything with your fists. You just won't learn. Well, uh, I know. I. Well, okay, maybe I'm stupid. But that's why I can't turn down a chance like this, don't you see? No. There's something about this place. It's. It's creepy. There's something in the air here. I don't smell nothing. Even the books on the shelves. <laughs> hey, I didn't notice that. Hey. <laughs> You know, these feel like leather. I bet they cost a bundle. Jack, just read these titles. The Transmigration of the Soul. Yeah. The Experience of Metempsychosis. <laughs> One soul, two bodies. Stella, you don't have books like this to read. You keep them around to give the joint a touch of class. These books are old, Jack. So old. Then they gotta be worth a lot of dough. Yeah, and all of them are about souls that leave the body. Well... Isn't that what happens when people die? Okay, Jack. You got all the answers. I just wish you knew some of the questions. Oh, you must be Mr. Jack Handley. Come in, come in. Now, I I'm going to confide in you, because you look like an honest young person. Uh, who, who are you? Oh, I'm Mrs. Toomey, Mr. Fraser's housekeeper. Oh, shh, let's not make a sound. Why? What's up? Uh, Mr. Fraser's... Oh, how to put this? Well, he, he isn't well, and, and so you should do nothing to excite him. Okay. Uh, uh, dear old gentleman, I, I do believe that... Aha! Uh -huh. That can only be our Jack Henley. Here it is, three o'clock, and here you are, right on time. Mr. Fraser, you promised the doctor to take a nap. And I did. Also to take a pill. And I shall. Now, Mrs. Toomey, excuse us. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I hope you and the young gentleman have a, a most agreeable afternoon. Well, Jack, ready to go to work? I'm ready to be told what the work is. What do you want? I want to make you rich. <laughs> Why? One step at a time. You asked me what I wanted. I told you. Why is another question and tomorrow is another day. Okay. Did you know that you are now the owner of a Mark 9 Borghese Fratelli? Here are the registration papers made out in your name. <laughs> Surprised? Why? I told you the car was yours. Yeah, but I thought just to Now, you. please, sign these documents. Well, what kind of documents? Merely applications for bank accounts, Jack. Now, Jack, take that suspicious look off your face. You've filled out cards like these before. Well, w w what kind of bank account? I said I wanted to make you rich. Therefore, I intend to give you a rather large sum of money. Now... Do you want to carry half a million dollars around in cash? Half a million? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, you can't carry it around in your pocket, can you? Uh, well? Uh, of course not. So we put it in the bank. In your name. Uh, uh, Mr. Fraser, I don't want to get you all upset, but... Look, I have to know why. Is that what's bothering you? Yeah, that's what's bothering me. How do I know you ain't setting me up, huh? Jack, how, I how assure I know... you that I am a completely reputable businessman. Yeah, but... yeah, sometimes they're the worst kind. Look, it all comes down to this. What do you want? That's a fair enough question, I suppose. Jack, I want your body... Hey, wait. Uh, I want your body. And in exchange, I'll give you mine. Well, now, let's 
place this thing in perspective, the art of exchange, of trade, is as old as history. Men have traded almost everything you can think of, empires, goods, even wives. So just because you never heard of people trading bodies doesn't mean it can't be done. Here's an offer you might not get every day. Say you're a young man of about 28, tall, strong, attractive, and a frail, elderly gentleman offers you a fortune to exchange bodies with him. What do you do? Laugh? Edge away quickly? Notify the men in the white coats? Jack Hanley has just received such an offer, but he's still sitting there because the old man has already put his money where his mouth is. I become you, you become me. But how could that happen? Let us say it could happen. So, you're saying I become a sick old guy who's going to kick off in a couple of years, and you get a whole lifetime? Jack, you're 28. You've been in serious brawls. You've been arrested for breach of the peace. You've cracked up several cars. How long do you think you can live? Two years? Three years? Your luck has run out. You'll die and your body will go to waste. What are you giving up? A lifetime? No. A few years, maybe months, perhaps even days. You can't afford to turn me down, Jack. But what you're saying, it's impossible. Let me worry about that. This way, you're guaranteed two to three years of a life of luxury. But but how could you and me exchange bodies? It would be a sort of transplant. No, no. No, no, no dice. None of that operating room for me. No surgery. That is no physical surgery. This would be psychic surgery of a sort. What are we even talking about it for? The whole thing is crazy. It's a joke. Well, then the joke would be on me, wouldn't it? But I'm willing to take the chance. You are, huh? I'm willing to enter into a verbal agreement with you. I agree to place at least half a million dollars in your name, in return for which, on demand, you permit me to take over your body. Do you agree? (laughs) It could never happen. I need your agreement. But I don't believe it. Whether you believe it or not, you have to state the following if you want all this money. You must say... Yeah. I agree to the exchange of bodies with Leroy Fraser. (laughs) But it is crazy. I must have the statement, but we have no deal. Okay. If it'll make you happy, I agree to the, uh, what was it? Exchange Exchange of bodies bodies with Leroy Fraser. With Leroy Fraser. Okay. Well, now, that's in order. So, what about this, uh, job? Hmm? The job? Yeah. Don't you see? Your job is to enjoy life until such time as you are required to surrender your body. Oh. I might add... You must take excellent care of it. Uh, uh, not that this could ever happen, Fraser, but, um... I mean, how do you enforce a thing like this? I mean, just suppose, uh, if and when the time ever comes, I... I just tell you to go and soak your head. Too late. You've already agreed. You do. Uh, oh. My name is Mr. Soames. Do you need help? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm Hanley. Uh, Jack Hanley. Hanley, Hanley. Did did you say Hanley? Yeah. Oh, sir. Oh. Have a chair. No, no, not this one. Uh, this one. Oh. Here, sir. Oh. Uh, this is so much more comfortable. Uh, a cigar? Uh, no, no, no. I, I just wanted to check on check? the... Uh... Oh, check? Uh, by all means, sir. Check us, inspect us, audit and balance us constantly. We will measure up to your highest expectations. Uh, no, well... And I... we are honored uh... that a man of your standing should have chosen our bank. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. I, I, I just uh, wanted to make sure that the, uh, the account... The account, sir? Yeah, yeah, that there... That there is an account. Oh, yes, indeed, sir. The account in your name has been opened, and it's in perfect order. 
you will find us your kind of banking institution. I've been to all the banks. You know how much it adds up to? Five hundred and ninety thousand dollars. Well, say something. What do you want me to say? I I want you to say what you think. You know what I think. Yeah, I shouldn't have told you. Oh, you've got to break that agreement somehow. Agreement? You know, I listen to your talk, and I wonder, have you got all your marbles? You did make an agreement with this, Mr. Fraser. All I did was I went along with a gag to keep some old nut happy. But it's an agreement. Look, all right, why don't we just forget it, huh? Okay. You know, I... I think I've figured out a way you can break it. Who wants to break Don't it? Don't touch the money. Don't take a nickel that's in the banks. Now, how much of the 500 did you spend? Now, look here. And give him back the car with a full tank of gas. No, no. No, no. This baby is mine. All mine. Oh, please, Jack. You know where we're headed tonight? Meridian Oval. Jack. Yes, ma'am. I called up the whole crowd. Spread the word. Jack is back. Jack, you... You're not going to race. In this one? <laughs> Won't be a race. It'll be like wheeling the baby home. Jack, suppose... Suppose so... I crack up the car, so what? So what? Yeah, so what? This heap goes for 21 thou. Big deal. All I got to do is write out a check. But you can't... That's all there is to it. Listen, I got to educate you on how to behave. You see, uh, you never had any real dough in your life. Jack... You don't understand. Another thing. I'm getting sick and tired of being told by you that I don't understand. Jack, this Mr. Fraser, he wouldn't make an agreement like that unless he knows something. Or unless he's lost all his marbles and he's a loon. I got the inside dope from his housekeeper. Give it all back. You know, Della, you're starting to be a drag. Oh, Jack, I, I'm only thinking of what's best for you. You know... I found out what money is these past few days. I found out. You know what money is? Everything. Oh, sir, all of a sudden you're Mr. Hanley, and it's... Yes, sir, Mr. Hanley. It's an honor, Mr. Hanley. And you know what? I like it. Oh, Jack, I just wish I could... Save it. Now, just ask yourself a question. All the time we've been running around together, you were smart, I was dumb. Is that the way you wanted it? What are you talking about? Were you looking for the kind of setup where you call the shots? I only try... Do you need a guy who's a dummy so you can be the wise one? Oh, Jack, if I've been... Well, if I've been making the decisions, it was only because it I wanted... It was only because you wanted to. You were against this from the first minute. You didn't even know what it was, and you were against it without even knowing why you're against it. Well, I'm still against it. What are you stopping for? So you can get out if you don't like it. Oh, is that how it is? Yeah, baby, that's exactly how it is. Well, goodbye, Jack. Who are you kidding? You'll come back. Ha! You always come back. Hey, Jack, where'd you get them wheels? What do you say, Jer? What are you trying to do, blow us all off the track? I see the word is out, huh? <laughs> Crazy, Jack. Man, you won't be happy that you kill yourself, huh? Look at me now, Jerry, old buddy, because in five more minutes, you won't see me for dust. Boy, a car like that on a two-bit track like this. I'm just warming up for the big time, Jerry. Yeah, but it's been a couple of years since and you I'm were... better than ever. Hey, there's the flag. Yeah, I'll see you, Jerry. George, do I look like somebody whose name would be George? Oh, yes, yes. The voice is different, but there's the same kind of spirit she had. She? Who? George. George Sand. And who was George Sand? A friend of mine. What are you doing here? I'm waiting for Jack Hanley. How did you get into the apartment? Same way you did. I have a key. Oh, I came here to give mine back. Oh, you must be the old guy. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Well, 
You don't look so old. Thank you. Well, everybody's here. Jack, what, what happened to your face? Nothing. Couple of scratches. I walked away from it. For what? I hit the turn too fast. I totaled the car. So what? Jack! Look, that's enough out of you. What are you doing here, anyhow? Well, I thought maybe we could... No, 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 no. We do things my way or no way. All right, Jack. Then it's no way. Goodbye. And this time I mean it. Sure. See you tomorrow. Well, Fraser, what can I do for you? You cracked up the car tonight. I can afford another one. Our agreement calls for you to take care of your body. Have a cigar, Pa? By continuing to take foolish risks. You can cancel the agreement. I can, huh? Oh, yes. That's too bad. I got the money. It's in my name. How could you get it back from me? I couldn't. It's yours. Yeah, so I'm holding all the aces. You have a powerful hand. I feel a bit weak. Ah, oh, there's a... There's an excellent brandy in the cabinet. Could you pour me a bit, please? Hey, smells pretty good here. You mind if I try a shot myself? Certainly not. After all, it belongs to you. Oh, yes. I forgot. Thank you. Well, happy days. So, the agreement's busted, huh? Ah, uh, no. No, not the complete agreement. You see, only the part of it that gives you the two to three years. Is that right? I can't take a chance that you will live that long. Not at the rate you're going, so... So what? You are required to surrender your body on demand. You agreed, remember? Sure, sure, I remember. You want some more of this brandy? No, but help yourself if you like. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, you were saying? I was saying you agreed to surrender your body on demand. But I demand it now. Huh? Huh? The exchange will be made tonight. There is a vital essence, a special quality, a unique consciousness that makes up the individual core of each of us. Is this essence, or soul, as some would call it, transferable? Mr. Leroy Fraser has bet close to a million that it is. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. 56 degrees at Midway Airport. Leroy Fraser and Jack Hanley have an agreement. They will exchange bodies. Each will become the other. Jack Hanley will become Leroy Fraser... Old and infirm. Leroy Fraser will become Jack Hanley, young and vigorous. Maybe. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm laughing at you. At me? Yeah, you. Do you really believe this? Believe what? Believe that we can swap bodies. Certainly. Certainly, he says, look, I took your dough. Ask me why. Why? Why? Because an old clown like you, you had to lose it. It's like you were you were standing on a street corner. You were saying, here's my money. Take my money. Might just as well have been me. That's not exactly the way it happened. You received this money as part of an agreement. Oh, yeah, the agreement again. You and Della, you'd make a great pair. We might at that. You know, I must say, Pop, you're, you're, you are cool. I mean, you are very cool. You're sitting there with a bust hand and you make out like you're holding a royal flush. Well, time for the exchange. <laughs> it will be over in a minute. <laughs> All a crazy idea. What makes you so sure you can do it? Well, you see, I've done it before. You what? Oh, yes. Many times. <laughs> Who are you kidding? Nobody. I'm serious. You're the one who keeps insisting this is a joke. Okay, okay, enough is enough. Look, I'm tired. I want to go to bed, so take off. Come on, Fraser, beat it. Look, don't make me throw you out of here. Try to get up, Jack. Huh? Just try to get up. Huh. Oh. <laughs> 
feel kind of dizzy. What did you do? We have an agreement, you and I. We have an agreement. No. No, no, sir. It's the brandy. You did something to the brandy. But I drank it, too. And I feel fine. No. Now, listen, Fraser. You can't. You can't. You can't do it. Have you read any of the books, Jack? The books? What books? The books on the shelves. Why? Why would I... So you would know, Jack. You'd know how it was done. I... I didn't read nothing. It doesn't matter. You shared the room, the wisdom, the power that is in the books. I I don't feel so good. No, Jack. You feel fine. Uh, There are just changes. Changes? Changes taking place in your soul. What what kind of changes? Just changes that will prepare it for a journey. The journey from your body to mine. My soul is also preparing. She was right. She was right. She said she was scared. You should have listened to her. Ah, 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 my my head. My head is... Flipping wide open. No, Jack, you're uh, fine. You promised. You promised me three years. Two years, you promised. Ah, oh, but Jack, I can't believe you. Uh, I can't breathe. Yes, you can, Jack. Uh, you're fine. Look, I, I promise. No, Jack. Uh, I can't uh, trust you. You, you can't. Uh, I swear. With what you know now. You'd kill me. I, I feel cold. I, I, I feel stiff. I, there is I, a law. I, it's written in the book. No. No. The mind. The soul. The essence. I can't, I can't the living breathe. force. The vital spirit. It's free. Unfettered, unbound escape. Escape the petty prison of the faltering body. Escape. Be free. Something's tearing at my inside. Escape. Leave me. Leave this shattered hulk. No. Leave me. No. Go to him. No. With the no. magic of ancient Egypt, I, the wisdom of Greece, by all the sciences the ancients knew, let our souls be free. I don't want to die. I have been the vital spirit in the bodies of 15 men before this no. night. Now, now, no. I shall become Jack Hanley. No. And how are you this morning, Mr. Fraser? Uh, What? Oh, I... I feel like I'm 80 years old. (laughs) Well, the truth is you're you're not far from it. What what, what are you saying? Now, Mr. Fraser... Who who, who are you calling Fraser? I I know it's early in the morning, but we have things to discuss. I'm not Fraser. I'm... I'm Jack Hanley. Oh, this is not the time to joke, sir. Uh, don't, uh, don't you understand? I'm Jack Hanley. What, what, what am I doing here? How did I... Sir, please, look in this mirror. What? Uh... Now, I... uh, sir, c- can we talk about... How did he do it? How did he put me into his old body? Oh, I better call the doctor. I get the doctor. Call the police. He stole my body. And doctor, he, he's got this crazy idea. He's somebody else. Doctor, doctor, I have to talk to you alone. Uh, please excuse us, Mrs. Toomey. Oh, all right, doctor. Listen. I am not Leroy Fraser. No? No, I'm Jack Hanley. I'm I'm 28 years old. Come, Fraser. You're talking to me, the doctor. Oh, I'm Jack Hanley. Fraser somehow found a way, uh, maybe a drug or something. He was able to get me into his body, and, and, and he took mine for himself. I see. That's what happened. 
Fraser, old friend, you need rest. I'm not Fraser. Now, don't excite yourself, Leroy. You won't believe me. None of you believe... I know. I know you look at me like I'm a nut. Some rest and quiet and... Uh, you're a doctor. You should see it. Of course, of course. F- Fifty years ago, if a guy said you could transplant a heart, you'd say they were crazy. But they can do it today, eh? can't they? Well... Sure. Sure. So why couldn't somebody figure out a way to transplant a guy's soul? We'll discuss it first. No, we won't. We'll discuss it now. Della, she knows. She was afraid it would happen. Yeah. Can you prove it? No, Fraser. Now, don't you try to stop me. Hello? Della. Who's this? Me. Who are you? Jack. You... You're not Jack. Della, listen to me. It happened. It happened. What happened? The agreement, Della. He went and he did it. What? What are you saying? The answer. The answer's in those books. Now, Della, go to the apartment. Find the answer. Look through those books and hurry. Yeah, Della, she's going to prove it. And meanwhile, you'll just rest. Now, I'll be right back. How is he, Doctor? Well, we'll have to get him to a sanitarium. Whatever gave him the idea that he that he's a young man? A delusion. A not uncommon delusion. A yearning for better, happier times. Uh, should we get him ready to travel? Yes, go in and help him dress. I'll make some telephone arrangements. Oh, certainly, Doctor. Mr. Fraser? Mr. Fraser? Oh, Doctor, he... He's disappeared! Sergeant! Sergeant! Sergeant Burns, remember me? I uh, know, Pop. I can't say that I do. My name is Jack Hanley. Jack Han... Well, yeah. that sounds familiar, but, but... But he was a young guy. I am a young guy. Look, a man named Fraser, an old man, he stole my body and he left me his. Well... Oh, well, come on. No, it's true. Yeah, sure, sure, Pop. Don't call me Pop. I'm younger than you are. Now, look, friend, why don't I have one of the officers take you home? I'm huh? Jack Hanley. I was here three days ago. Jack Hanley was here three days ago, not you. I am Jack Hanley, and I can prove it. Sure you can. Sure, sure. You called me cop fighter. Huh? Yeah. Cop Now, how would I know that if I weren't Jack Hanley? Huh? If I, if I were some old man, how would I know that? Well, it's... And another thing, how would I know that your wife called while you were talking to me? What? Your wife. She called, huh? She said your son had just said daddy. Now, wait a minute. How would I know that, eh, Sarge? Now, look, Burns, you're a cop. Well, you're a good guy, and you're the only chance I got. Well, what do you want me to do? Come over to the pad. Della's there. She'll show you the books. I'll show you the brandy, and I'll prove to you how it was done. Adela can prove it. Now, come on, come on, come to the apartment with me. Well, come on in. Oh, sure. Sorry about last night, Della. Who are you? Yeah. Yeah, Della. And, honey, I've been doing a lot of thinking. Have you? About what? Oh, about you and me. Yeah? And? Well, you couldn't be too angry with me. How do you know? You wouldn't have come back here this morning. You want to know why I came back here? Why? I got a phone call from Fraser. Fraser? Why would Fraser call you? Oh, it, it was kind of a, a crazy story. What did Fraser say? Would you answer a question first? Sure. Do I still remind you of, of George Sand? Oh. Well, do I? Yes. More and more every minute. <laughs> I looked her up. Her name was Amandine Dupin. (laughs) You could be right. What do you say we get out of here? Where are we going? I don't know. But we're both 28. And it's a long, long trip. Della! Della! 
killer. Oh, hey, Pop. Now, what are you handing me? There's nobody here. Just last night. Last night. Sure, there were, sure, There Pop. were books on that shelf. Well, there. there's nothing there now. Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, thank heavens you're safe. Ah, ma'am. Now, this old gent claims... Sergeant. That... Sergeant, I'm surprised at you. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Yes? Oh, oh, for you, Sergeant Burns. Oh, thank you. Yeah? Oh, you check the bags. I see. No record of deposits in the name of Jack Hanley, huh? What? Well, naturally, where would a dumb hood like that Don't... get money? Who'd give it to him? Don't you see? He's got my body. Sure, okay, I know. It was a wild thing, but give, give me... you know how it is. Anything can happen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right. Oh, Pop. Pop, what are we going to do with you? Don't call me that. Where's Della? She crossed me. She went with him. Now, Mr. Fraser, you, you'll you feel so much better in the hospital. So much better. I am not Fraser. I'm Hanley. I am Jack Hanley. Won't anybody believe me? Now, look. Get some rest. Oh, Pop. Any Anybody believe me? Now, you'll feel better with good food Someone, and lots of sleep. Somebody has to believe me. Won't anybody believe me? Believe me. As he sits there, Leroy Fraser, or if you prefer, Jackson Hanley, he sits there in his room in a faraway sanitarium, and he keeps asking the question of everyone who will stop to listen. So far, no one believes him, or is willing to admit it. All I can admit right now is that I'll be back in just a few moments. Somewhere, there's a man who says he can go back through 15 lifetimes. That could be 800, 900 years. He could have landed at Hastings with William the Conqueror. He could have sailed with Columbus, served with George Washington, ridden up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. And if this is true, he will soon need another lifetime. Let's hope he doesn't take a fancy to yours or mine. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Bryna Rayburn, William Redfield, Dan Ocko, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contac, the 12-hour allergy capsule, Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome again through the creaking door. The sound which always signifies the beginning of another tale of danger and suspense. Being in the mystery business, our fables often deal with crime and criminals. This time, it's a thief. But a thief with a very definite difference. For Ruth Moody is a young lady who walks into department stores and simply helps herself. Simply because she can't help herself. Yes, you've heard of her peculiar ailment. It's called kleptomania, the neurotic impulse to steal. But kleptomania isn't the only trouble in store for Ruth. I got a proposition for you, Mrs. Moody. How would you like to make a thousand bucks? A thousand dollars? How? Well, you do like I tell you. You'll get a thousand bucks in the mail. 
But if you don't... Wed, your husband may not be able to make a living anymore. You uh, get what I mean? No. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about stealing stuff, Mrs. Moody. About that bad habit of yours. Now, we got a use for that habit. And you'd better listen to what we have in mind. <laughs> mystery drama, The Trouble with Ruth, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slusser and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Barnett's department store in the downtown shopping district. And if it looks and sounds like a battlefield this morning, it's no different from any other Saturday. Well, maybe a little more so since Barnett is running its semi-annual clearance sale, just as it does every other month. It's the ideal place and time for bargain hunters. And unfortunately, for shoplifters. Uh, pardon me, miss? Yes? Uh, would you mind coming with me just for a moment, please? What for? Uh, our assistant manager, Mr. Hutchins, would like a word with you. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Hutchins. Why should you want to talk to me? No, please don't make any trouble. I could call the guard and have you escorted upstairs. You wouldn't want me to do that now, would you? Guard? Well, why? What have I done? I think you know exactly what you've done now. Will you uh, please come with me quietly? Right in here, please. It's a mistake. I did take the scarf, but I was going to pay for uh, it. Here's the lady, Mr. Hutchins. All right, Bill, thanks. You uh, want me to stick around? No, 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 it's all right. Okay, then I'll get back on the floor. It's murder down there. Uh, more larceny than murder, I'd say. All uh, right. Please, uh, sit down. Mr. Hutchins, I, I know it looks like I took the scarf deliberately, but really so I You were going to pay for it at another counter. Is that the idea? No, I... I wanted to match the color with the purses, and that's why I put the scarf in my bag. I wanted to go over to the handbag section. Would you mind telling me your name? I'm not a shoplifter, so help me, I'm not... My name is Ruth Martin. Is it Mrs. Martin? Look at me. Can't you tell I'm not a thief? I don't even know why I took this scarf. It's just a cheap little thing. It's not at all like the clothes I wear. Well, look at me. Can't you tell? Would you wait just one moment, Mrs. Martin? What's that you've got? Oh, it's just a little handbook we keep, sort of a private record book. You see, uh, most of the retailers in this city cooperate in these matters, supplying each other with the names of known kleptomaniacs. I'm sure you've heard that word before. I am not a thief. Well, that's what I'm trying to determine, Mrs. Martin. Since there is a significant difference between shoplifters and kleptos. The difference, of course, being our ability to prosecute, since one steals for gain and one because... Well, because she can't help it. No, I'm afraid I don't see any Ruth Martin in the book. All right. It's Moody. Pardon? My real name is Mrs. Ruth Moody. I... I didn't want to give you my real name. I... I didn't want my husband to know Moody. about this. Uh, yes, yes, here it is. Ferraro's. Three spools of thread. Pearl buttons from Wilkins and Smith. Oh, well, the last time it was a handbag. Awful, ugly, beaded thing. It wasn't even worth more than five or six dollars. Are you going to call my husband? Is that what happened at these other places? Yes. Oh, it was awful. Please, I, I have the money to pay for the scarf. I, I'll gladly pay you twice what it was worth. Please don't let him know it happened again. Don't you think it's best that he know? Maybe he'll try to help you over the problem. Don't make me beg you. My husband has a job in the city government, a very important Mrs. job. Mrs. Moody, and... I'm not interested in causing you any trouble, believe me. Look, here, take the scarf back. Well, what's this? N uh, nothing. Uh, some costume jewelry that no, I bought in Mrs. another... No, Mrs. Moody. 
You didn't buy this any more than you bought the scarf. It still has the price tag on it. A dollar ninety-five. That's what makes it so unbelievable, Ruth. A dollar ninety-five rhinestone pin. Don't know why I took it, Ralph. Any more than I know what drove me to pick up that awful scarf and just drop it in my bag. Just like those other times. Yes, but you swore to me that those other times would never be repeated. Well, I thought it was over. I really did. I don't understand what goes on in your mind when you do these crazy things. I don't know. It's just an impulse. It seems so terribly easy. The things are just sitting out in the open the way they are, and I I never even stop to think if I like it. Just if I can get away with it. But you never do. You get caught. (laughs) Maybe... Maybe that's part of the sickness, too, huh? Oh, stop saying I'm sick. I'm not. I'm not. Well, what would you call it? Now, look, honey, you, you've got to see a doctor. I've told you that a dozen times. I will times. not go to a doctor. I can't stand the idea of it, Ralph. Just talk to one. Give them a chance. Maybe it's something something simple. Maybe, maybe you're just trying to get punished because of guilt feelings that you can't resolve. Oh, you're wrong about wanting to get caught. I don't. I swear I don't. I've gotten away with a dozen things. What? What was that? Nothing. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And it isn't just three, four times that this has been going on. You're probably out there shoplifting every single day. That's not true. I almost never go into the stores for exactly that reason. All right, Ruth. That settles it. You are going to talk to a doctor. And then, uh... You do remember the first time you stole, Mrs. Moody? Yes. I remember very well, but... But it was something I really wanted then, Dr. Berger. That was the big difference. Mm. How old were you? I was about eight or nine. I was in school. There was a girl named Fanny Ritter. Her family was very wealthy. She was always the best-dressed girl in the class. Ah, yes, yes. She had this pencil box. It it was absolutely beautiful. With a blue binding and all sorts of secret compartments. I wanted that pencil box so much. And one day I I walked into an empty classroom. And there it was. Lying on the seat. Yes, and uh, were you caught? No. I was never caught. Mm -hmm. But that was the biggest thrill of all. Not being caught. But then I... I also realized I couldn't use the pencil box. At least not at school. Yes, yes, I see. All kids steal sometimes. There's nothing abnormal about it. But, uh... You're not a child now, are you? And yet, you still crave this secret feeling, this secret gratification. No! No! You're wrong. I don't get any pleasure out of taking things. I feel terrible afterwards every single time. Ah, but that may be exactly the gratification you require. I don't want to hear any more. You sound just like my husband. Believe me, Mrs. Moody, neither your husband nor I want to find fault with you. We both want to help you. Well, it's his job my husband is worried about, not me. Why do you say that? Because he works for the city government in the controller's office, and he's afraid if they ever found out about me that he... Why am I talking about Ralph that way? (laughs) I know he loves me. I know he wants to help me. Yes. So why don't you let him try? Let both of us try. No. I don't need a doctor. All I need is to stay out of department stores. Mrs. Moody? Yes? Uh, hi, Mrs. Moody. Uh, you don't know me, but my name is Tom Andrea. Uh, there's something I have to talk to you about. I know exactly what it is. Encyclopedias. <laughs> or is it magazine subscriptions? Uh, no, ma'am. It's uh, nothing like that. Well, whatever it is, I- I'm not interested. It's about department stores. What? You know, stores where people buy things and uh, take things, too, sometimes. Are you from Barnett's? 
No, Mrs. Moody, I don't work for Barnett's or for Wilkins and Smith or any of those places that you like to uh, shop in. Uh, but look, it's uh, pretty drafty out here. Uh, can't I come in for a minute? All right. Thank you. Uh, your husband's not home, I suppose. Uh, I mean, it's a working day, so he's at work, right? Oh, that's clever thinking. <laughs> Can we uh, talk in here? Only if you get right to the point. Well, now, look, this ain't the kind of thing you like to just blurt out. I mean, I mean, it's kind of sensitive. You, you know what I mean? No, I don't. I mean, it's about you and your husband and so forth. If you think about it for a while, you'll get my meaning. Am I right? You'll have to be more specific. Why, well, you just won't come out with it yourself, huh? Okay, I'll say it for you. I'm talking about you being a shoplifter. That's a lie. Whoever told you that is a liar. No, 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 no. It's true. Wait a minute. If you think you can blackmail me by telling my husband... Oh, no, Mrs. Moody. We know that your husband knows all about it. He's been getting you out of jams for years. Then what do you want here? Well, believe it or not, I want to give you money. I don't want to take any from you. What for? Services rendered. What? <laughs> I got a little proposition for you, Mrs. Moody. How would you like to make a thousand bucks? A thousand dollars? How? Well, you do like I said. You'll get a thousand bucks in the mail. But if you don't... Well, your husband may not be able to make a living anymore. You uh, get what I mean? No. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about stealing stuff, Mrs. Moody. About that bad habit of yours. Now, we got a use for that habit. And you'd better listen to what we have in mind. How did you know about me? Who told you about me? Well, let's just say I got sources. I swear to you, I'm not a thief. Yeah, yeah, sure, I know that. We know it. We? Well, me and my friend. We know you're just a sick lady that you can't help what you do. It's... Well, it's just like you had pneumonia or hay fever. It's, it's not your fault. Am I right? That's right. Yeah, well, it's fine. Only your husband still don't want the people around City Hall to know he's got a klepto for a wife. Does he? Then this is blackmail. A man in his line of work, he can't afford to have people know his wife steals. Now, some people would understand how it's only a sickness. But others... Well, you know how people are. Tell me how much money you want. I don't want a dime from you, Mrs. Moody. Honest, all I want is your cooperation. You see, my friend and me, we, um, we have a little plan. A really, really sweet little idea. Everybody makes money and nobody takes any chances. Oh, what could be sweeter than that? A plan to do what, for heaven's sake? Well, my friend will give you all the details. All you got to do now is put on your coat and come with me. My friend will give you the whole deal. I'm not coming with you. We're not desperate for your help. Don't get this wrong. But we thought we'd give you a break. Oh, well, that's too bad. If, if you just tell me what you have in mind. Why, shoplifting, Mrs. Moody. A little nice and easy shoplifting. Only this time, not for no $5 piece of junk. This time for something worth more like $50,000. Well, troubles have a way of multiplying themselves, don't they? And as you've just heard, the trouble with Bruce has suddenly developed serious complications. Will Mrs. Moody's unwilling petty larceny turn into a larceny of the grand variety? We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Two. And now back to the CBS Mystery Theater. Mrs. Ruth Moody... Faced with the prospect of harming her husband's career, has accepted the invitation of the man who calls himself Tom Andrea. 
although her instincts tell her that Tom Andrea isn't his name at all. As they drive towards their unknown destination, she steals sidelong glances at him, noting the copper sheen of his skin, the look of a man who has spent far too many hours under a sun lamp. But he also has the look of a man who won't take no for an answer. Can't you tell me where we're going? Now, relax, Mrs. Moody. It won't be long now. Who is this friend of yours, anyway? You all meet him. He works for a department store, doesn't he? I know they keep records of people like... full of kleptomania victims. That's the only way you could have found out about me. I just lean back and enjoy the ride, huh? Aren't you afraid I might recognize him if he's one of the people that I've met? Here we are, Mrs. Moody. I told you it wasn't very far. The Hotel Hamilton. Looks like a fire trap. Well, it's not very fancy, but it's private. We can all have a nice, quiet talk. Just the three of us. One moment. Is that you, Tom? Yeah, it's me. The lady with you? Yep, she's here. Just a second, then. Uh, no, no, don't, don't be scared, Mrs. Moody. My friend doesn't really look like that. He's just got a stocking over his face. Come in. I uh, hope you'll forgive the mask, Mrs. Moody. I know it looks grotesque, but it's necessary for your own protection. For me? It's important that you don't recognize me after our business is concluded. It would be embarrassing if we were to run into each other in... Uh, Different circumstances. In a department store, for instance? What my friend means, Mrs. Moody, is that if you started hollering for the cops when you saw him again, we uh, would have to do something about you. Understand? Yes, I, I understand. But please don't be alarmed. Nothing like that's going to happen. I can assure you that I am not a professional criminal. No more than you are. Then what kind of criminal are you? Why don't you sit down? The sofa's the only comfortable seat in the room. Here, let me take these papers away. I was just drawing up a few diagrams to help you understand exactly what you have to do. Diagrams? Would you like some coffee? We have a small kitchen. There's pot already oh, made. Yeah, no, I don't want any coffee. Tom, why don't you do the honors? Do you drink yours black, Mrs. Moody? I'm afraid I don't have any cream. All right, uh... Black coffee. I oh, see, Mrs. Moody. I told you it was going to be very friendly. Well, now, uh, how much has Tom told you about our little enterprise? He just said that if I didn't help you, you'd tell my husband's employers about me. Well, I really hate for that to be the inducement, Mrs. Moody. I was hoping that uh, you'd cooperate more willingly. Why should I? Well, didn't Tom mention the thousand dollars? He also mentioned something about $50,000, about shoplifting something worth a fortune. Don't tell me you have qualms about it. A lady with your history? <laughs> you just don't understand about me. I don't take things because they're valuable or even because I want them. I'm not a thief. Not in the ordinary sense of the word. Yes, yes, we, we know that. And that's exactly why we're taking you into our little circle, Mrs. Moody, because... You're a kleptomaniac, not an ordinary thief. And that's why you can help us commit an extraordinary crime. But I don't want to commit a crime, and I don't want your thousand dollars. Here's your coffee, Mrs. Moody. Let me tell you what makes it so different, Mrs. Moody. An ordinary crime entails a certain amount of risk. But this particular crime is guaranteed to be risk-free. Oh, that's what people always think. No, Mrs. Moody. Even professional criminals recognize a certain degree of chance when they plan their enterprises. Personally, I would never get involved in anything like that. I loathe the idea of being arrested. Well, so do I. And I know exactly what it feels like. Ah, but you've never been arrested, have you? You've been detained, questioned, reprimanded, warned... 
But you've never been arrested once. Isn't that true? Well, why should I be? I told you, I'm not a criminal. No, you're not legally liable for your little thefts, Mrs. Moody. You steal because you have to steal. And if you're caught, you merely give back what you've stolen. And that's that. No arrest, no prosecution, no risk. You beginning to see the point, Mrs. Moody? You want me to steal something for you. That's right, Mrs. Moody. And something a great deal more valuable than, shall we say, a school of thread. Oh, dear Lord. Let me explain our plan in detail. At 12.15 tomorrow afternoon... Tomorrow? At 12.15, you'll enter a shop called Travel's on 47th Street, just off 5th Avenue. You may not know the place. It's a rather expensive jeweler's. You will approach a certain counter... The diagram will make it clear which one I... Wait a minute. You're talking as if I've already agreed to do this thing. Please look at the diagram, Mrs. Moody. You will approach this counter and engage the attention of the salesman. You will ask to see a certain tray, the one I've marked with the arrow. A moment or two after you begin to examine that tray, there will be a disturbance in the store. Uh, right, a disturbance. The disturbance will take place on the other side of the counter... It is almost inevitable that your salesman will have his attention drawn away from you when it occurs. In all likelihood, he'll leave you and go to see what has happened. That's when you will act. You will pick up the diamond pin on the upper right-hand corner of the tray and drop it into your purse. And then you'll simply walk out the door. You're really mad. As you can see from the drawing, the distance between the counter and the door... It's a very short one. You can reach it within three or four seconds. You can be sure that your salesman will be much too occupied to notice that you have left. I won't do any such thing. That's plain and simple robbery. When you reach the outside, you'll see a man with a yellow canister collecting funds for children's welfare. The man will approach you immediately. You will drop the diamond pin into the opening of the canister and walk to the corner. There will be a taxi there, in all probability. It's a hack stand. If there isn't a taxi waiting, hail one or walk to the bus stop. Believe me, you will have ample time to make your getaway. There isn't going to be any getaway. I am not going to do anything so insane. As I said before, you'll be perfectly safe. You'll have absolutely nothing to lose. If you're stopped before you reach the exit, simply give yourself up. When Travels learns of your little... Uh, idiosyncrasy, no harm will come to you. It'll be just another neurotic incident, nothing more. You're wasting your breath. You'll tell them about your problem. They'll check with other stores and find your case history on file. No, there's no way I'll do such a thing. Hey, what's uh, the matter with you, lady? Didn't you hear the man? You can't get into trouble doing this. But your husband will if you don't. Let me out of here, please. Pick someone else out of those files. <sighs> All right, Tom. If that's how Mrs. Moody wants it. Then I can go. The door was always open, lady. See? But if you change your mind, Mrs. Moody, just call me here at the Hotel Hamilton. Just ask for room 408. But if I don't hear from you tonight, well, you know what we'll have to do. You've sure been quiet tonight, Ruth. Have I? You, uh... You didn't go out today, did you? No. I told you I wasn't going anywhere. I was just wondering. I mean, you said something about dinner tonight, about cooking something special, and... <laughs> here we are with last night's meatloaf. But you said you didn't mind. Oh, of course, I don't mind. You know I'm not fussy about food. I know. You're just... too nice for your own good sometimes, Ralph. And, uh, you just weren't feeling up to cooking today, is that it? Oh, I know what you're thinking. You think I went on another shopping spree, or should I say shoplift? No, Ruth, I didn't think anything of the kind. Well, I didn't. I swear I didn't. Okay, okay. Ralph, can I ask you something? Sure. What, what would happen if, if people knew about me? What people? The people you work for in the controller's office. 
Or uh, the mayor himself. What if they knew about my uh, illness? They'd know, that's all. Would it hurt you? Honey, this is silly. Nobody knows about your problem but you and me in a few department stores. And Dr. Berger, of course, the doctor you won't see anymore. But if they were to find out... Would it hurt you? Look, haven't we got enough to worry about without thinking the worst? Then it would be bad for you. Someone in your position where honesty is so important. Ruth, you're not dishonest. You're sick. There's a tremendous difference. That's why I'm so sorry you won't see that doctor. But, but would everyone understand the difference? I mean, when they learned about my stealing things, would they think twice about you? You want the truth? Yes. Yes, they would. They're only human. No, no, they're worse than human. They're politicians. They have to be elected to office. And that's exactly the kind of scandal they don't like. Yes. I guess I've always known that was true. Um, honey, I think I could use some more gravy. Yes. Oh, I have some in the kitchen. I'll be right back. This is the Hotel Hamilton. Room 408, please. And so Mrs. Ruth Moody has taken the first fatal step. And tomorrow at noon, she'll take several more steps to the doors of Travel's jewelry. And for the first time in her life, Ruth will steal and know the reason why she's stealing. Will it really make a difference? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. Now back to CBS Mystery Theater. At 11.30 the next morning, Mrs. Ruth Moody left her apartment and took a Fifth Avenue bus to 47th Street. None of the other passengers saw anything unusual in her expression. They couldn't read the turmoil of her thoughts or the fear that haunted her eyes behind the sunglasses she wore to hide them. She kept telling herself that what the man in the stocking mask said was only too true, that no matter what happened, she couldn't be blamed for what she was about to do. She was still telling herself that when she pushed open the heavy glass door of Travel's. May I help you, madam? Oh, uh, yes, please. I'm looking for a diamond pin. It's a present for my mother. I see. Uh, do you have any particular kind of pin in mind? We have everything from abstract designs to representational pins. You know, animals and flowers and so forth. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I just uh, browsed a little? Certainly. You can see some of our selection right here, but uh, we do have others. Oh, yes. There's so many, aren't there? Uh, of course, it would help if you knew the price range. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, well, the price isn't important. It's just that the pen be right. Yes, I see. Um, this tray right here, on the first shelf. Yes. Well, that seems to have quite a few nice pens. Yes, I'll bring it out for you. Actually, these are some of the best stones in our collection. You have good taste. They really do sparkle, don't they? Uh, this is uh, what I made by a representational... As you can see, it's in the shape of a cat. Oh, well, no, no. My, my mother hates cats. I think maybe just something simple. Something. Well, you will just take your time. All right. Thank you. What was that? Someone smashed one of my cases. Excuse me. I'm I, I, I clumsy thing to do. It's, it's all my fault. I was holding my umbrella under my arm that just slipped out and hit the glass. Now, I, I, I'm terribly... I've got to do it now. I, I, I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I've just got it. Just step back, please. Uh, Bob, uh, would you lend a hand over here? There's glass all over the merchandise. I feel dreadful about this. It's quite really all right, sir. I... No harm done at all, I assure you. Uh, I've done it. 
I've really done it. Outside. Help the needy children. Help the needy children, lady. What? Please help the Children's Welfare Society, lady. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Here. That's all I have. Thanks very, very much, lady. Thanks a lot. Help the needy children. Is that you? Yes, I'm home. Oh. How are you, honey? Uh, I'm all right. You sure? You don't look so good. No, no, I'm uh, I'm fine, really. Would you like a drink? Yeah, I wouldn't mind, thanks. Um, what'd you do today? I went out for a little while. Where to? Oh, no, in particular, I took a walk. Weather was nice. Uh huh. Took some things to the cleaners. Did a little marketing. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. For heaven's sake, stop looking at me like that. I can't bear the way you look at me sometimes, Ralph. I'm sorry, Ruth. It's nothing deliberate. Well, of course it's deliberate. It happens all the time now. You keep staring at me as if you're trying to read my mind. As if you wanted me to confess something. Now, Ruth, that isn't true. You've got to stop thinking such things every time I look at you. What's going to happen to us, Ralph? What kind of marriage are we going to have from now on? Ruth, we've been married six years now. I think we know how to live with each other. But you can't live with this disease of mine. You can never stop suspecting me of having stolen something again. Isn't that what you're thinking right now? All I'm thinking about is that you don't look well. And how disappointed I am that you won't see Dr. Berger. I... I called him today, by the way. What for? Well, I just wanted to talk to him, find out if... if there was anything more I could do to help you. And what did he say? He said there might be. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I told Berger about our talk last night, about... How worried you are that the people at City Hall might find out about, about your illness. Oh, he told me that was an important part of your guilt syndrome, whatever that means. Oh, I hate that psychiatric double talk. Well, just the same, he, he thought you'd be a lot better off if you weren't concerned about such things. If you were able to admit that you were ill. I do admit it. That doesn't mean that other people have to know about it. Ruth... I told them. What? I told McGuire, the controller. I took him out to lunch. And I told him all about your kleptomania. Oh, no, Ralph. Oh, no. Look, I, I began to it? realize that I was hiding it, too. That I wasn't treating it like an illness, either. That I was acting as if it were something shameful. Oh, what did you do it for? For us, Ruth. But now you'll lose your job. No, I'm not going to lose my job. It's going to be all right. But you said... No, you I know that... all the dumb things I said last night about how this sort of thing can hurt a politician. Well, I was wrong. McGuire is more of a human being than a politician. You mean he's not going to tell anyone else? He won't give me away? No, that's not what I meant. McGuire suggested that we both... Go and talk to the mayor himself about this. Oh, Ralph, you can't. I already have, Ruth. What? I've seen the mayor. And you know what he said? He said that it wouldn't make any difference to him this year or next year when he recommends me for the number one job in the controller's office. The number one? That's right. McGuire is moving up. I'm next in line for his job. And the mayor is behind me now, Ruth. Do you think he'd be behind me if he... Really thought my wife was a thief. Oh, dear Lord. Ruth. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? Honey, honey, what is it? Oh, why did I go through it? What's the matter, Ruth? I just told you everything's okay. <laughs> I've ruined everything now, Ralph. <laughs> if you knew what a horrible thing I did today. <laughs> what are you talking about? I am a thief now. God help me, Ralph. I really am a thief. Steve. <laughs> Try 
mind, stay calm, Lou. Did you get a look at the man who broke the glass with his umbrella? Do you think that he was the same man you met yesterday at the Hotel Hamilton? I'm sure he was. But I told you he was wearing a stocking mask over his face. And this this other man, the, the one who called himself Tom Andrea, he was the same man who was collecting for children's welfare outside the store. Yes. Ruth, you know, there's only one thing to do now, don't you? What do you mean? We've got to tell the police. Oh, Ralph, no, that would be awful. Travels will have discovered the theft by now. They, they must have your description from the clerk. Sooner or later, you might be identified. But they can't do anything to me, Ralph. I'm not responsible. I'm sick. No, Ruth, in this case, you are responsible. That's why we have to call the police. Mrs. Moody, here's the typed statement you gave us. Can I go home after I sign it? Yes, yes, of course. But uh, better read it over first. What happens after that, Lieutenant Ames? That depends. On what? Well, mostly on whether or not your wife has told us everything. But I swear I have. I'm not saying your story is phony, Mrs. Moody. My own viewpoint is that it's too cockeyed to be phony. But uh, that may be a subtle way of looking at it. Why should she lie about this, Lieutenant? What would my wife have to gain? Well, she could stand to gain a diamond pin worth almost 50,000 bucks. But she doesn't have the diamond. She gave it to them. Yes, that's a story. But uh, let's say, for example, that those two men never existed. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say. I'm telling you how other people might see this thing. If you were a crook, and you realize that you'd been spotted in Travell's? Well, this story of yours would put you in the clear, wouldn't it? But it's true. Every word of it. But you see the problem, don't you? You've been identified as the robber. You've confessed to stealing the pin. The fact that you're a known kleptomaniac doesn't help. Some people might even be nasty enough to say that you got yourself that reputation deliberately. This is incredible. You're accusing my wife of being a thief. Oh, what can I say to convince you? If you could only give me a better description of those two men. Well, I've done the best I could. The first man, he was of average height, dark hair, very sunburned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep telling me about that sunburn. But that's not going to last very long, is it? Lieutenant... You think that sunburn was a kind of disguise? I'm sure it was, Mr. Moody. And the other man, he wore a stocking mask. There's no way I can describe him. What about the hotel, Lieutenant? No good. It's a kind of a dump which doesn't even bother to keep a register, even though it's a city ordinance. But the clerk might be able to identify the man who took the room. Maybe, if we could produce him. Only, uh, how do we do that? Uh, what about the thousand dollars they promised to send her? Oh, I wouldn't count on that. If she's telling the truth, you'll never hear from them again. Okay, so maybe it's a new gimmick. Maybe one of them works in a department store, has access to the names of recognized kleptos. I'm sure he did work in a department store. Yeah, and so do thousands of people, Mrs. Moody. All you've got to do is name the one. And if she can't, what happens then? I think you know the answer to that. Will I be arrested? But you can't arrest her. She's sick. She was seeing a doctor. And I'm going to see him again. Oh, oh, so help me, Ralph. Do you really mean that, Ruth? I'm... I'm not going to stop seeing Dr. Berger until I'm cured. Unless they send me to prison first. Well, have you read the statement, Miss Moody? Yes. Yes, it's all right. I'm ready to sign it. Fine. Now, let's see, uh... I thought I had a pen on this desk. Oh, well, I think there's one in my purse. I'll get it. Hey, it's funny. What is? Well, this isn't your pen, Ruth. I don't recognize it, do you? Let me see. No? No, that isn't my pen. Oh, Ruthie, no, not again. You mean you stole it, Mrs. Mooney? I'm afraid I did, I... I remember now when the man was drawing the diagrams of the jewelry store, he left his pen on the coffee table and I... I 
just couldn't stop myself. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You stole his pen, the man in the stocking mask? Yes. Will you arrest me for that, too? Let me see it. Miss Moody, do you realize there's a name on this pen? It's from Barnett's department store, and it's engraved with the name of the owner. What? Barnett's department store, J.M. Hutchins. Hutchins? He's the assistant manager. He is the one. Lieutenant, you found your man. <laughs> well, what do you know? This is the first time I've ever seen a proof of that old chestnut. Old chestnut? That it takes a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> moral of this story might be, never steal anything small, particularly if it's a diamond pin worth $50,000. Will you be happy to know that the police investigation proved the guilt of Mr. J.M. Hutchins and the innocence of Mrs. Ruth Moody? And the last we heard, the only trouble with Ruth was going to be a little one. I'll be back shortly. you've enjoyed our story and we hope your reception has been as good as the reception we've been getting at the Radio Mystery Theater. In case you haven't heard, we're attracting millions of listeners all over the country. Yes, television has its rabbit ears, but we have human ears. Thank you for lending them to us. Our cast included Marion Seldes, George Petrie, Jack Grimes, Jackson Beck, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Well, I don't know if it was the gin or a strange kind of sickness, but they found him one morning hanging upsides down from his veranda rail, crazy as a loon, carrying on about someone watering his copra. He died in a convulsion. Oh, was it thought to be the island? Oh, no proof. But the next man, Vickers, shot his head, blew his head right off. And the first of the line of the Benton Far East Company, old Adams, he just plain up and disappeared as though that damn tropical forest reached out like a, a octopus and swatted him. Oop, line and sink <laughs> No, sir. No, sir, Mr. Witcher, traitor or not, promotion with your company or whatever. <laughs> You wouldn't get Captain Ben Randall here to set one foot on the beach at Fallis Ah. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... to the terrifying world of your imagination. I have an unusual story for you about a crack in a cellar wall that resists all efforts to repair it. Despite all the learning through the ages, despite the world's great progress in physics, chemistry, biology, 
there are certain matters which cannot be explained by our computers or our wise men. Matters which may never have a logical explanation. Mr. Carroll, the contractor, was the first to admit that the crack in the wall was beyond him. I'm not a superstitious man, Mrs. Sanford, but something is happening here I, I can't explain. Look at that crack. Not a speck of mortar on it. Looks like it hadn't been touched in a hundred years. But I swear I closed it up not five minutes ago. I, I swear it. That, that cold draft blowing from it. Like from a tomb. Like from a tomb. <laughs> mystery drama, The Crack in the Wall, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Celeste Holm. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It was a cold, rainy, windy day when Paul and Nora Sandfort laid their child to rest in Green Tree Cemetery. Despite all the soothing words of friends and relatives, Nora's despair was inconsolable. She felt that nothing could ease the pain in her heart caused by the loss of her only child. Our Father, which art in heaven... Darling. My baby. Why did she have to die? Nora, darling, please. Our religion teaches us that God, in his infinite wisdom, Don't decides. Don't speak these empty words to me. I accepted that because it never touched me before. I never thought of it. But our daughter, that beautiful, innocent child, just 16. Why? One does not question these matters, Nora. I do question. For the first time in my life, I question. I would do anything. Anything to bring my Ruth back to this world. Nora, please. Now you know that's impossible. Why? Why? Because our little girl, Ruth, is dead. Burnt to death. Nothing you can do or say or hope can change that. <gasps> Yes, Nora. Are you busy with something? No. I'm well, just reading the newspaper. First chance I've had to take a look at it today. The minister was here today, Dr. Fowler. Oh? Say you want to see our new house. New? This house is over a hundred years old. Well, new for us, he meant. It was just an excuse to come here, actually. He wanted to know why I hadn't been to church in the last several months. What did you tell him? Oh, I don't know. It was awkward. I said I'd be back next Sunday. Made some excuse about not having felt well lately. Well, I'm glad. About my going back to church? Yes. But more important than that, it means that you're getting over this, this depression, getting out into the world again, beginning to forget. No. No, you're wrong, Paul. I'll never get over wanting my little girl back with me. I'll never forget. Please believe me, Nora. I loved Ruth, too. But I accept the fact that she's gone from us forever. Uh, I'll never accept that. Oh, by the way, now I remember what I wanted to remind you about. What? It's about that crack in the cellar wall right in front of the washer and dryer. There's a terrible draft that comes from it. There's no crack there, Nora. No crack? I thought I'd get rheumatism in the cold draft when I did the washing today. It hit you right in the back. No, I, I had that repaired. I paid for it. It's on the general bill for the repairs we had to make on the old house before we could move in. Well, then they cheated you. Charged you and never did the job. You sure? Seems to me that I remember. It's never it. been done. Those contractors will try. You know, it's Mr. Carroll, isn't it? His number's on the telephone stand. Why don't you call him? Oh, it's 7.30, Nora. Well, come to think of it, it's... 
The only time I could possibly reach him would be at night. He'd be busy all day out on the job. Hello, Miss Carroll? Paul Sanford. I'm sorry to bother you, but one of the items on your bill to me for repairs on my house, uh, item 28, repair crack in cellar wall, north side interior, $45.60. You never closed up that crack. You what? Hold on a minute. Nora, he says he supervised that item himself, mixed the cement for it. Well, just tell him that he's got it wrong. Mr. Carroll, my wife says the crack is still there. It hasn't been repaired. Okay, sometime tomorrow morning? Right, thank you. It's kind of funny. He said he's willing to bet $100 that he completed the work. Mrs. Sanford, I, I'm finished with the job, and I want your okay. Uh, I'll put on the pot and give you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thanks, I'd appreciate that. Uh, come right down. I'm in a bit of a hurry. Won't be a minute. I'm coming, Mr. Carroll. Mrs. Sanford, the strangest thing. What did you say, Mr. Carroll? Uh, look at that wall. Oh, dear. Another crack? Uh, no, it's, it's not another crack. What? What? It's the same crack. I, I just filled it with cement. But you couldn't have. It looks old and dry. Look at my hands. They're still covered with cement. Here are my tools, my trowel, my, my hammer and chisel. I, I, I could swear it was closed up not five minutes ago. And, and that cold dry. Long from it. Like from a, a tomb. Like from a... Oh, Mr. Sanford. Come in, come in. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. Well, come into the study. We won't be disturbed there. They're right this way. Uh, you sit down, won't you? Thank you. Please forgive me for interrupting you at this hour. I don't quite know how to begin. As you know, we've been through a horrible experience. Yes, losing your daughter in that fire. It's our only child. Just 16. Yeah, Mr. Sanford, you must get hold of yourself. Yes. You, you see, I've been holding my emotions back for months... I had to be strong for Nora's sake. Well, she's taken this very hard, yes, I know. Yeah, she hasn't gotten over it. It shook her to the very foundation of her belief. I gathered that it's been only recently that you both came back into the church. She is... She's definitely twisted mentally. Her preoccupation is with a crack in the cellar wall, which she says cannot be repaired. What? Well, there's a long, jagged crack in the cellar wall. It's been there since we bought the house earlier this year, after our other house burned down. Have you tried to have this crack filled with cement? Oh, yes, yes, we tried. The way you say that is very strange. Well, I paid Carol the builder for repairs on the house. He was certain that he'd repaired the wall. However, he came back and patched up the crack again when he asked for my wife's okay on the job after he'd finished. They went down to the cellar and looked. The crack was open again. I, I don't understand. Neither do I. Carol said that he'd not left the cellar, that he'd called my wife to look at it. What's your explanation? I have none, Dr. Fowler, none. <laughs> Uh, yes, Nora, I'm... I'm filling up the crack in the wall with cement. Do you think that's wise, Paul? Wise? Well, I thought you wanted the wall repaired. Kara won't come here anymore, so... Well, that's what I mean. Paul, there's some very good reason why that wall resists repair. Well, that's a strange way of putting it. Wall resists repair... 
So you thought the wall had... I don't quite know how to put this. It's as though the wall had... Had a will of its own? Nora, that's ridiculous. Is it? Mr. Carroll tried twice to fill that crack. He gave up. Yes, I know. I just received a check from him for $45.60, refunding the money I paid him for the job. Come on, let's go upstairs. This old cellar gives me the creeps. Look! My God. It's disappearing. The cement... The cement I just put into the cracks dissolving into thin air. Mr. Edmund, I'm I'm calling about this house you sold us. No, 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 it, it's a good, solid old house. It's just that my wife isn't happy here. We're all alone, as you know. It just isn't right for us. Y- yes, I know, I'll, I'll have to take a loss if I change now, but I'm prepared for that. Okay, I- I'll see you tomorrow, around five, okay? Good. Goodbye, Mr. Edmonds. Oh. Who was that on the phone? Oh, no, I, I called Miss Redmond's. The real estate man? That's right. You're thinking of selling? Well, I thought you'd want to get out of here too, Nora. Whatever gave you that idea? Well, now, that's a very strange attitude. Don't you know what this all means? No, no, I, I don't understand it. Frankly, it scares me. Ruth is trying to reach us. What are you talking about? It was just two days ago. I was lying in bed. You were sound asleep. I heard the clock chime three. I felt something urging me to leave the bedroom and go down into the cellar. Nora, I've got to take you to a doctor. Paul, I'm not out of my mind. I tell you, our daughter is calling to me. She's trying to get to Darling, me. Nora, listen to me. What you're saying doesn't make sense. Our child is dead, Nora. Burnt to death. I spoke to her. I spoke to her through the crack in the cellar wall. You what? I spoke to our roof. And she spoke to me. Paul. Wake up. Huh? Wake up. Uh. Nora, what time is it? Shh, quiet. Now, do you hear? Hear what? She's calling to me. Our little girl. She wants us. She needs us. Nora, listen to me. You don't hear anything. You you just think you hear because you want to hear. Listen. I don't hear anything. There it is again. She's very faint, but you can hear it. You try hard enough. Please, darling, try to rest. I've made an appointment for you with Dr. Cooper. I don't need a doctor. Did you hear it? Who's calling you? Yes. Sounds like it's coming from... The cellar. I must go to her. No, no, don't. You mustn't... My little girl is calling. I must go to her. Was Ruth calling to her mother, or was Paul Santfort falling into the clouded supernatural obsession that controlled Nora's life? He thought he heard the voice of his dead child calling to her mother. He couldn't be sure, but Nora's certainty was so strong that he was almost convinced that he heard it too. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Everything that Paul and Ruth Sandford believed in is being drained away. They are living in a nightmare of twisted emotions, pulled farther and farther from the normal life they had known into a tangled, dreamlike world in which they hear the voice of their dead child calling to them. You're not going down into that cellar, Nora. It was Ruth's voice calling. Are you coming with me, Paul, or shall I go down alone? Nora, please. Now, we're dreaming this. It isn't happening. I heard her voice. You said you heard it. She was calling to me for help. Are you coming with me, or shall I go alone? 
I'll come with you, dear. Just to prove to you that there's nothing there. Nothing. How could there be? I know there is something there. Come. Now, wait, wait. Don't try to go down those steep cellar stairs in the dark. Turn on the light. It's out. It's not working. Here, let me try. Oh, I'm not going down there in the dark. There's some candles in the cupboard just outside the door. Get them. Well, candles won't do any good. Get them. Uh, I just remembered. I, I've got a flashlight in the kitchen table drawer. Hurry! Here we are. Now stay right behind me. I'll go first. Flash the light around. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing but that crack in the wall. Let's go back upstairs, Nora. Good evening. <gasps> oh, what? Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry if I frightened you. What? Who are you? What are you doing in our house? I'm doing... I am inspecting the wall. The wall that needs repair. And who are you? Why, I'm the helper. What are you talking about, helper? Whom are you helping? You. I don't like this, Paul. Please make him go away. If, if you want me to, I'll go. But I thought you needed me. Now, I want you out of here. Or... I see you have a hammer in your hand. <laughs> You're afraid of me. Believe me, I came to help you. Who sent you? My, uh, employer. Who? Your friend. Your friend who knows of your sorrows. He sent me to seal up the crack in the wall. Well, I've tried. Several people have tried to do that. It won't stay closed. I can close it for you if you want me to. I repeat, if you want me to, you may not want it. Why? You will not hear the voice of your daughter ever again. No, no, no. Don't, don't seal it. Please. <laughs> Nora. Now, maybe it would be better. No, no. No, this is insanity. Nor our daughter is dead. Dead and buried. And you think that is the end? Of course. It's the end of mortal life. And do you share your husband's beliefs, Nora? No, no. Ruth was calling to me. I want her back. I, I want to hold her in my arms. Am I dreaming? This can't be happening. What are we doing standing here talking to this... Paul, please, don't. There's no one here. He was here? Where is he? He couldn't get past us up the stairs. Nora, where did he go? Who? Oh. D Nora, d darling. What's happened to you? Speak to me, dear. Speak. Paul. Oh. Oh. What are we doing here in the cellar? How, how did we get here? And you say, Mr. Sanford, that you think you saw this uh, creature in the cellar of your house? No, it wasn't what you say. No, not a creature. It, it was a man, small dwarf like he said he'd come to repair the wall at three o'clock in the morning uh you saw this man too mrs sanford no i don't know what paul's talking about i didn't see anything i was fast asleep paul woke me and told the story mm, i see your daughter's death was a terrible shock to you both it's it's preying on your thoughts your grief pushed the normal day-to-day -day living from your minds you began to I imagine... I heard her voice, Doctor. I heard Ruth's voice calling to me. Of course you did. But try to think rationally, Mrs. Sanford. You know it's impossible for you to have actually heard the voice of your dead daughter. Seriously, you can't believe you did. But I... Can you? Seriously, can you believe that? I... I don't know. <laughs> so simple if you recognize the true authority. Who 
are you? I am merely a conveyor of ideas, a messenger. Then you are sent by the devil? Perhaps. Perhaps I'm your friend. Uh, Call me the helper. Can you help me? Can you bring my daughter back to me? Under certain conditions. But you might find the cost too high. Ah, Tell me, nothing, nothing is too costly, too terrible. I'll, I'll agree to anything. Even if it meant that you would lose everything? Everything you've been taught about life and death since you were a child? Oh, yes, 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 I agree. I agree to anything, anything just to help me save my child. Help me. Help me. Nora, Nora, wake up. Nora, you, you had a bad dream. Darling. Help me. I agree to anything. Darling, Nora. Oh, oh, oh. You were crying out in your sleep. I woke you. Oh, he came to see me and told me that I... Who, darling? That... Ugly little creature. I'd seen him before, but I can't remember where. The helper. That's what he calls himself. I heard Ruth calling to me. Then he appeared. I don't know what it is. I don't want to know. We're getting out of this house and we're not coming back. Oh, you go, Paul, but I can't. But don't you see what's happening to us here? Something evil is pursuing us either to destroy us or drive us insane. No. No, I can have my daughter back. He'll help me. You can't believe that. I believe it. What does he expect in exchange? I... I can't tell you, Paul. I... I just can't tell you. Oh, Dr. Fowler, right on time. Is um, Mrs. Sanford home? Uh, No. No, I called her sister and got her to make a date with Nora so she wouldn't be here. My work is suffering. We're not sleeping well. Nora's had terrible dreams, nightmares. You told your physician, Dr. Coombs? If anyone can help us, it's God. Dr. Fowler, we have seen the evil one. What? We have seen him. We have spoken with him. It's either the devil or one of his emissaries. He calls himself the helper. My good man, in this enlightened age, when we speak of Satan, it is usually, uh, well, what I mean to say is we we think of the devil as the embodiment of all evil, but not as an actual being. I see. Well, Dr. Fowler... If you can't help us, we may have to go to someone who can. There are groups where they believe in the devil. Mr. Sanford. Paul, please understand. I cannot believe in the devil's being other than an abstract name for evil. If I can show him to you, will you believe me then? I saw him. I have seen the devil and the devil's work, and I'm frightened to death. Sorry to bother you, Dr. Combs, but something very disturbing has happened. Yes? Uh, You know the two people I referred to you, the Sanfords? Yes. In your opinion, Dr. Combs, would you say that they were insane... Well, I don't know, Dr. Fowler. The word insane is a legal one, not a medical one. Well, uh, deranged then, mentally ill. Well, I would say from a very cursory examination that they were both suffering from severe emotional stresses brought on by the untimely death of their only child. Well, would that explain their hallucinations? Hallucination? Uh, to put it bluntly, Doctor, they think they have been speaking with the devil. Have seen him, in fact. Hmm, not exactly a common delusion in this day and age. If they need medical help, they must come to me. I can't solicit... Yes, 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 I realize that, Dr. Combs. Uh, Perhaps a sanitarium would be the best place for them. They could be taken care of and have a change of scene to get over the grief that they feel. An excellent idea, Fowler, but who's going to commit them? 
Can you get them to commit themselves voluntarily? I don't know. I'll try. Have you come to any decision? I've been thinking about it. I've heard you say you would do anything to have your daughter back. You had made up your mind. Yes. Oh, yes, but... But still, you hesitate. What? What you've asked of me is almost... Well, I'm almost afraid to think of it. It's been in my mind, awake and asleep. I, I can't tell the difference anymore. You hesitate. Thinking of yourself while your daughter suffers. Oh, no, no. I will leave you now. Perhaps never to return. This is your last chance. <gasps> Nora. Oh. Nora, no, darling, no, listen to me. me. You're having I'll, bad dreams. I'll, I'll do anything. Wake, wake up, please. Me. Nora, Nora, it's me, Paul. Oh. Oh, what? Open your eyes. No. You're all no, right. No. You're safe with me. Darling, it's me, Paul. Yes, um, it's all right now. Paul, uh, I've made my decision. What decision? About Ruth. I am going to bring her back. Bring her back? What are you saying? I'm going to bring her back no matter what the cost, no matter what the consequences are. Nora and Paul have come far along a tortuous, a frightening path. Now Nora is determined to see the matter to the end, despite the consequences. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Forces are tearing at the sanity of Paul and Nora Santfort. Nora's sleeping and waking worlds are so much the same that she can no longer differentiate between them. In her thoughts, in her ears, are the words of her dead daughter calling to her for help. Paul thinks he has heard the child, too, but is uncertain. He is not sure whether or not it is the driving influence of his wife's obsession or what he has actually heard and seen himself. I don't know, Doctor. I, I don't know anymore. Everything is so confused. I want you to sign commitment papers for your wife. You mean put her in... In a good sanitarium, in a place where she'll be safe and, and receive the proper treatment for her... Uh, her, her problems. Well, I... I don't know. I... No, I don't think she's crazy. You're not in any condition to judge her mental health, Mr. Sanford. What do you mean? Oh, well, I mean I'm asking you to make a difficult decision. I'm also asking you to commit yourself. Joe! I won't think of it. Send him away. Send the doctor away. Paul, how can you do this to me? You know I'm not insane. You heard her. That night, we both went down into the cellar, and that little man, do you remember? The helper? You saw him, too. You know I'm not crazy. I won't go. I won't. You can't make me. She's gone into the bedroom, Dr. Coombs. Is there a lock on the door? No. Well, suppose I go in. Perhaps a sedative to quiet no, her. Please, doctor, let me speak to her first. She'll listen to me. Yeah, very well. I'll, I'll wait out in the car if you want me. Yes, yes, please go. I, I think she'll listen to me if you're not here. Nora? Nora? May I come in? Is that doctor still here? No, no, he's outside in his car. Paul, how could you do this to me? Deceive me, try to put me away. But I explained everything to you. I will never consent. I'm going with you, dear. I'm going in, too. Why? Paul, why do you want to do such a thing? Because I'm frightened. 
I've never been afraid in my life before, but this is all beyond me, beyond any rational explanation. And you think you'll be away from your fear in that place? Oh, Paul, I'm not out of my mind, and neither are you. How much longer can we stand this? Listen to me. What? I can tell you. Only you. What? I've made a pact with the helper. Oh, Nora. He has given me the power to bring Ruth back. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. That's impossible. Now, don't be foolish. Don't tell anyone else what you've told me. Now, you think I'm insane, too, don't you? Well, I don't know what to think. He has given me two wishes. Two wishes? Yes. He said that I would need two. Actually, all I need is one. To bring my dear child back. Yes. Yes, Nora, of course. Now, now, I want you to do something for me. What? Don't fight me now. Go along with me for a little while. Perhaps this nightmare will stop. We'll be able to get out when we want to. I have the doctor's promise. Can you trust him? Yes, darling. Since we're committing ourselves, we can get ourselves released merely by asking to be released. And our poor tortured child, who will be here to hear her call? Who will be here to comfort her, Paul? We're running away, deserting her. Darling Nora, our Ruth will be with us always, no matter where we are. Uh, oh, the phone. Oh. Hello? Hello, Mr. Sanford? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Coombe? I'm calling from the sanitarium. Is there anything wrong? Yes, your wife has disappeared. You mean walked out? Nobody saw her leave. As a matter of fact, it's a bit of a mystery. Her room was locked. Perhaps some, one of the attendants or nurses unlocked the door for her. No, we've questioned the entire staff. At one o'clock, the nurse assigned to that section entered her room to administer a mild sedative. Your wife had complained she was worried because you weren't there. Well, I was just cleaning up a few urgent matters here. I was coming to commit myself tomorrow morning. I told her that, but it didn't seem to have any effect. When was Nora last seen? Not more than ten minutes before 1 a.m. Another nurse on the floor answered her ring. She told the nurse about her anxiety and her inability to sleep. She hasn't returned home, has she? No. What do you want me to do, doctor? Stay where you are. She may come home. It's very likely that she will come there. <laughs> Sorry to be calling you at this hour, but Nora has disappeared. She walked out of the hospital. The fire, Ruth's death, it, it's been preying on our minds, and I thought that... Wait, Emily, I, uh, that's my doorbell. I'll call you back. I just wanted to know if Nora was with you. I'll call you back. Let me know if Nora shows up. Bye. Oh, Dr. Fowler. Come in. Oh, thank you. I got a call from Dr. Coombs about 20 minutes ago. Yes? He asked me to see you. He said you might need me. I came right over. Anything I can do to help? Nothing. Unless you can find Nora. She's been missing since about 1.30 a.m. About three hours. Where would she go? Where could she go? I don't know. What? What was that? I heard it, too. Do you have a cat, Paul? No. Sounded like a cat. It was Ruth. She's calling Nora. Ruth? My daughter. Oh, yes, yes, your daughter. But she's... She's dead. You hear your dead child's voice calling... You heard it, too. No. No, 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 it can't be. That's superstitious nonsense. That's what I thought. But I don't anymore. Ruth is calling to us from the grave. I hear it. I hear it. Poor 
will pray with me. Pray to God to make her go back. No. Nora will be here. She will come here in answer to her child's cries. Her mother's love is so strong that Ruth's outstretched hand will reach across the void of death and touch the hand of her mother. Yes? Fowler? Yes? I thought you were going to report back to me. I've just been through the most shattering experience of my life. You saw Mrs. Sanford? No. I'm not a superstitious man, Dr. Coombs, but I heard the voice of Ruth Sanford calling to her mother from the grave. Dr. Coombs, I I thought it was Nora. She hasn't returned yet, huh? I was talking with your minister, Dr. Fowler. He seemed quite upset. Any word from the police? Nothing. They've gotten several false telephone tips from cranks. Only one man identified himself by name, a, a Mr. Helper. Helper? You know him? Yes, I know him. The police asked him for his address. He gave them one, but it proved to be a phony. Do you know where to find him? You won't believe this, doctor. But the last place I saw him was in my cellar. What? I don't know how he got there. I I didn't see him leave, although I was standing talking to him at the moment. He he vanished. Vanished? Disappeared. I see. Uh, disappeared right before your eyes. Oh, yes. I remember you telling me about that incident when you both came to my office. Hello. Who's there? Paul? I've come home. What is he doing here? I won't go back to that place. He can't uh, make Nora, me go back. Nora, dear. Send him away. Paul, Paul, make him leave. We don't need him. Mrs. Sanford, as your doctor, You're I... not my doctor anymore. Please go. Leave us alone. Please, Dr. Coombs, your being here will just make her worse. Very well, if you think you can manage. I can manage. I'm sorry you feel this way about me. Good morning. He was trying to do what he thought best for you, for us. He has no way of knowing what is best for us. He was just interfering, keeping us from Ruth. Nora, please give up that mad notion. Give it up? Oh, no. Paul, I will not give it up. Tonight, this morning before dawn, we will bring our child back to us. Nora, think what you're saying. I've thought, and I've made up my mind. Before daylight, he said. What time is it now? It's 20 after 4. It won't be light before 6. We must do it now. Come. We'll go together. Go where? To the place I first heard her voice, calling to me, the cellar. The crack in the wall. Are are you sure you want to go through with this? I think, Nora. I've come too far to turn back now. I don't care what happens to me. It's Ruth we must think of. All right, Nora, I'll go along. I'd better get my flashlight. The light's still out in the cellar. No, Paul. What I must do must be done in darkness. No lights. Now, let's go down the stairs. Now, Paul, don't say anything. I must ask for her life from the master. Oh, master, listen to my plea. I have paid dearly for this boon. Heed my request and grant it to me in payment. I fear your presence, master, but I implore you, grant my wish. I I wish my daughter were alive and with me now. My daughter, please give me back my daughter. Ruth, where are you? Come to me. Ruth's voice. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, it's coming. I 
see her. Nora, I, I see. Oh, my God. Oh, no. No, no. Nora, stop this. Make her go back. Oh, Nora, she's burned her face. Nora, please, can't you stop? Nora, send her back. Send her back. Mutilated. She's mutilated. This figure, no, you can't bring her back into the world. You must send her back, back to her grave. Oh, it would be too cruel to bring her back. Too terrible. How can I do it? He gave you two wishes. He said that you'd need the second. Now I know what he meant. My dear daughter, we're dead. And back in her grave. Nora. Oh. It's over. Oh. It's all over. Our child is gone. Forever. Oh, Paul. May our dear child rest in eternal oh. peace. And so Paul and Nora were left to pick up the fragments of their lives and go on. Strangely enough, the crack in the cellar wall was finally closed. And no human hand had a part in its repair. I'll be back shortly. A mother's love cannot be measured by any instrument known to man. The supernatural strength to reach out into the void of darkness and bring back to life the child of her heart defies all the natural laws of nature. The answer can only be found in the terrifying world of the imagination, the world where anything the mind can conceive can happen. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Wes Addy, Robert Maxwell, Robert Dryden, and Ann Costello. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Once again, be my guest on a strange journey, a weird, wild trip through a mysterious, uncharted terrain, bounded only by your imagination. There's an expression, the night of the long knives, and it has come to mean an orgy of murder, and it usually follows a rebellion or a civil war. It's a time when many of those on the winning side take the opportunity to settle some personal scores. Why are you leaving, Roberto? It isn't obvious. Who can live here any longer? There is another woman. Oh, Pilar, there never was. There never will be another woman. You are going to her. There is nothing here for me any longer. That's a lie. Pilar, won't you understand? Yes, I understand one thing. You are tired of me. Pilar... One day, as soon as... I cannot have you, no one will. But I tell you, there is no one else. Roberto, don't leave me. Goodbye, Pilar. Patriots! Patriots, after him! That man running down the street, after him! He is a traitor! Our mystery...
mystery drama, The Longest Night, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Bryna Rayburn. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal and new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. about to discover one of those little-known, out-of-the-way restaurants where the food can only be described as heavenly. It's a safe bet. You've never heard of a place called Mama Pilar's. It is located in a tiny seaport village called Puerto San Jorge in an obscure Latin American country. It's a long way to travel for dinner, but be assured, it's worth it. Mama Pilar's doesn't look like very much. It's small, dark, narrow, but don't let that put you off. Seated at his usual table near the door is a chubby, pleasant-looking middle-aged man named Siriaco. Siriaco is unable to talk, but his guitar speaks for him. Tonight, the only customers in the place are Pete and Marge Miller, and they are obviously young, North American and newly married. This? <laughs> this is the finest restaurant in the entire world? <laughs> Darling, taste is the test. Now, come on, bear with me. Pete? Hmm? Whose picture is that on the wall? It's, it's just like one of those funny admirals in a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Marge, come on, don't talk like that. As if... As if what? Well, as if you're... Back home in a free country. Well, you see that picture everywhere. Is he some local wheel? Angel, he is the wheel. No kidding. He is the generalissimo. Numero uno. Our maximum leader. <laughs> Even so, he looks like a pig. Marge. Now, you can't talk like that in public. Besides, he's the client. He's the man I was sent here to sell. And, and you better pray for him. How can I pray for him? Instinctively, I hate him. You can see evil all over his face. Well, he's a very sick man. Oh, really? I understand he has severe ulcers. He eats like a pig. Ah, uh -huh. now you said the word. Uh, uh, here she comes. Who? The great lady, Mama Pilar herself. Welcome to this house. Uh, you don't remember me, Mama Pilar? Oh, of course I remember you, Senor Miller, but, well, I, I thought it best not to say so. Oh, Why? Well, I see this, this charming young lady as your wife. Perhaps she is not supposed to know you were here before. <laughs> <laughs> now, what would you like for your dinner? Mama Pilar, we are in your hands. Good. I hope you are hungry. <laughs> He's quite a character. It's amazing. Hmm? This dictator, what's his name? Oh, General Zaria. Zaria? He actually does look like a pig. Now, Marge, you simply cannot... Darling, I come from Iowa. I know a hog when I see one. You are a guest in a foreign country, oh, and you should have enough Pete, good sense you're to... always so afraid I'll say something to embarrass you. <laughs> we will have to socialize with this man. Be proud of me. I'll chatter so charmingly, no one ever will suspect that I've got a brain in my head. <laughs> oh. What? What is that... Oh, divine aroma. Aha, uh -huh. well, you taste it. Uh, now, good friends, your dinner. <laughs> oh, what is that? What? Food, that is all. That's all. What's a song? Notes. <laughs> but it's how these things are put together. <laughs> oh, thank you, senora. Uh, you have been married long? Uh, well, this is our honeymoon. And also a business trip. Oh. <laughs> well, can the two be combined? Mm -hmm. you, you will be here a while? Well, my company is working on a development plan with General Zaria. Ah, oh, yes. The leader will make us into a great nation. One day we will all be rich. Oh, sure. He promised. Well, don't bet on it. You, you think he lies? At least... I think. Marge. No, no. Tell me, senora. Who has poisoned you against our leader? The traitors? The cowards and doubters who fear to believe? Oh, you, you are a foreigner, so 
How can you understand that I love my leader because I love my country? When he fought the old government, that unholy alliance of thieves and oppressors, when he called for volunteers, I gave this man my only son. Go, I said to Ramon, follow him. And today, my Ramon is a captain. And one day he will invite me to the capital city and present me to the leader. Forgive me, I, I talk too much. Well, see what the wind blew in, a beggar. Mama Bilal. Yes, old woman, you found me. If you are Mama Bilal, I have a letter for you. A letter? For me? From your son. From Ramon? How is he? When did you last see Ramon? I have no time here. Take your letter. But, but I want to talk to you. Oh, well. A letter. Oh, that devil, Ramon. You'd think he'd come by to visit his old mother. No, no. Well, he is busy. Oh, senora, you... Uh, you read, I am sure. Me? I never did learn. Would you be so... I'm sure that it must be something private between you and your son. Oh, no, I... Ramon, no. Someone will have to read it to me. It would be a favor, senora. All right. Oh. Well, what does he say? His letters are always so amusing. My dearest little mother, when you receive this letter, I will be dead. Read. Read. Our leader has betrayed us. We thought we fought for freedom, but he has made slaves of us all. Mama, he is a madman, and now that he realizes I know him, he will kill me with his own hands. Avenge me, Mama, avenge me. My last thoughts are of you, your loving son, Ramon. You lie, you lie. You make up this ugly falsehood because you hate the leader. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, he... Mommy Pollock, can we help you? Leave me. Well, if you need anything, we'll be in the capital city. Goodbye, Mama Pilar. Siriaco, you see that face? The face that looks down upon us from the wall? I will kill him, Siriaco. I will kill him with my own hands. And after I have killed him, I will weep for Ramon. Marge? Marge, darling, I'm sorry a thing like this had to happen. Pete? Hmm? I know you have a job to do in this country, but I can't take any part in it. I will not socialize with that man. I will not visit his palace. He will not be invited to my home. But, darling... I refuse to discuss it. All right, dear. All right. My leader. My leader, you are breaking your diet. Oh, shut up. You... Yes, my leader. What appointments have I this afternoon, Escobar? Dr. Suarez is to here at any moment... Then the young North American engineer, Senor Peter Miller. Is there more meat? My leader, what will Dr. Suarez say when he sees you have broken your diet? I am starved. <laughs> Dr. Suarez. Uh, get rid of that slop. Hmm? I gave you a diet. Now, what are you doing? Uh, I must eat. I'm not a bird, I'm a man. You are a self indulgent fat slop. See, si, Escobar. See how he talks to me. Here you address our leader. Be quiet, you obscene little rodent. You, open your shirt. Mm. I don't care if the man is a doctor. He must have respect Dr. for our... Suarez, why don't you like me? Roll up your sleeve. I will take your blood pressure. I tolerate you because you are the best doctor in the country. But take care now how you provoke me. Be moderate. Uh, it's exactly my prescription for you. But I cannot live without good food, wine... Then die. Uh, you're not the only doctor in the nation. Uh, indeed not. Fetch some quack, some boot-licking flatterer. Tell him what to prescribe. 
I'm sure the charlatan will oblige you, and in three months you will be a dead man. Uh, good day. I will be here tomorrow. Mm. He's right. The dog, not a Russian. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll see the North American. Uh, same in, Senor Peter Miller. Moderation. Moderation and abstinence. That's the way to live forever. You must keep me to that diet, Escobar. Keep me to that diet, yes. Your Excellency? Yes, sir. Uh, I have here the report on all the preliminary studies. Have you, uh... uh... Yes, sir. An overall program to build hospitals, schools, bridges, aqueducts, drain swamps. We can transform the entire country. Can you? Yeah, now, if you'll examine these papers... Enough, sir. Sir? Be silent. Mr. Miller, do you know what you are? You, sir, are a barbarian. You enter a man's office, and with absolutely no regard for... for the amenities... You start slapping your business documents all over his desk. A, a, a thousand pardons, Your Excellency. Is it your impression that you will have me sign these documents and be on an aircraft bound for the United States within the hour? But no, sir. I'm, I'm completely at your disposal, sir. Uh, uh, I uh, <clears throat> understand your lovely wife is with you. How is she? Uh, f- fine. We shall hold a reception in her honor tonight at the palace. Uh, I'm... I'm afraid she's not feeling well. Uh, it's been a long trip. She's not a good traveler. Oh, I am sorry. Uh, perhaps tomorrow. Uh, y- y- yes, sir. Or the day after. Now, uh, be sure to convey my warmest personal regards to your lovely bride and, uh, and let us know when she will find it convenient to honor us with her presence. Y- yes, yes, sir. Good day. Uh, good, good day, sir. <sighs> Now, what remains to be done today, Escobar? Ramon. Ah, yes. Ramon. He waits in his cell. We shall miss Ramon. He was a fine boy. He was a traitor. A criminal. Is there a family? He never spoke of anyone. Ah, these ambitious country boys. They get big ideas. And soon they grow ashamed of the old peasant mama back on the farm. Well, whoever she is, wherever she may be, let her believe her boy died a hero. To say something nice on the radio, Escobar. Yes, my friends, this brilliant young soldier, a hero of the Holy Revolution, was one of our leader's closest companions. Patriots, mourn for the man our leader called my friend Ramon. Swine. Oh, I will avenge you, my little Ramon. I will avenge you. Oh, Siriaco, did you get the flowers? Oh, oh, what a beautiful bouquet. Oh, thank you, Siriaco. Thank you. And now, dear friend, we must practice. I I, I will stand outside the palace gate and wait for him to come. You pretend to be the pig. Now, now, you are leaving the palace. Start walking toward me. I call out, my leader! You you hear a woman's voice. You look. You see a peasant. Her face, it, it shines with adoration. I hold out this bouquet and... Because you are a depraved and evil man, the sight of sincerity must always amuse you. You step forward to receive my homage, my gift... I extend it eagerly, lovingly. And as you reach out to take it, my right hand withdraws the knife from inside the flowers, and I step and thrust. Mama Pilar has prepared many a peppery plate in her lifetime. But now she is assembling the ingredients for the most pungent dish of all. Revenge. The recipe will come to a boil when I return shortly with Act Two. Intense love, violent hate. These can be two sides of the very same coin. And 
Just as a coin can be flipped, so can the human emotions. Mama Pilau worshipped General Zaria, the dictator of her country, until he murdered her only son. Now she regards him as a pig to be slaughtered. And with this object in mind, she approaches the presidential palace. In her hand is a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Hidden among the stems is a knife. Clutching the bouquet, Mama Pilar addresses the soldier who stands guard at the gate. Senor, I, I beg your pardon. Can you tell me if our leader will be leaving the palace today? Why do you want to know? Well, I, I want to give him this lovely bouquet of flowers. <laughs> How do I know there is not a bomb hidden inside those rose buds? I know, Oh, oh, you better beat it. But why? He's going to get the very rough around here. Sweetheart, go home. Take your hands off me. You can't get near him. He's surrounded by his personal bodyguard. I want to get him. Nobody out. ever gets within 50 yards of him. Move back. Move back, sweetheart. I have a gift for my leader. Run, sweetheart. They love to hate. Oh, uh, let me help you. Don't touch me. You'll be okay. You just fainted. No. <laughs> oh, now, don't cry. Don't cry. Let me alone. You're pretty lucky, you know. We used to have a captain of the guard. He gave orders to kill people. Don't cry. Don't cry. Why don't you just go home? <laughs> You must sign these death sentences, my leader. How much longer must I wait for food? Till 2.30. Uh, it's three quarters of an hour. What can I have, eh? A carrot. A carrot. Don't let me cheat. I warn you. Don't let me cheat. <coughs> yes? Hmm. It's Senor Peter Miller. Uh, admit him. Uh, let him in. Uh, Dr. Suarez. A uh, swine. Yeah, but, but, but he's right. You must not let me cheat. Your Excellency? Uh, seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I have here the reports of a field Tell survey. Tell me, Mr. Miller. Hmm? Why doesn't your wife like me? Oh, well, sir. Now, you may ask why should it matter to me if the spouse of some... some machinery peddler, which is all you really are, dislikes me. Oh, but, but sir... I have is... feelings. I dislike being snubbed. I am entitled to courtesy. I deserve consideration. I have the right to be taken seriously as a human being. Who is your wife, anyhow? Now, sir, the... Now, I... sir, but, sir, it won't do. For two weeks now, you have refused all my invitations. My wife is still somewhat indisposed. May I send her our own physician, a man of international repute? Well, I... I... I think it's, it's, it's just a matter of getting, you know, used to the climate and... Yeah, the food. of course, of course, of course. You must remember to give her my regards. Uh, Y y yes, sir. I, I, I have some reports here. That reports? Should... Business? On such a glorious day? What, your excellency, the time grows short. Time, my dear boy, grows neither short nor long. She maintains her own steady rhythm despite all our futile efforts to hurry or delay her. Until tomorrow. Uh, y yes, sir. And... If your lovely bride is sufficiently recovered, bring her with you for cocktails. <laughs> I mean tea. Good day. Uh, good day, sir. How much longer, Escobar? Exactly 37 minutes. See to it. It must be a very large carrot. <laughs> Hello, Robert. Hello, Pilar. Human beings. <laughs> what an astonishing lot we are. After all that has happened, we meet by chance, and it's... Hello, Roberto. Hello, Pilar. We have not met by chance, Roberto. I have come here to talk to you. Oh? The last time you talked to me, you denounced me as an enemy of the revolution. It was here. Right here. On this very street. Please, Roberto. Well, you did. 
I lost my job, my property, most of my teeth. Ah, but that's no matter. There's not much to eat nowadays, anyhow. Roberto. Are you going to denounce me again, Pilar? You, you have every right to make this difficult for me. Roberto, read this letter. Read it. I don't read anymore. It's from Ramon. Yes? For the love of God, Roberto, read it. Very well, Pilar. Read and realize it is Ramon who writes. Yes, I see. It is Ramon who has written. And now that I have read it... Is that all you can say? What is there to say? I say I am going to kill the pig. Don't let me delay you. Roberto, listen. I cannot do it alone. He's surrounded by his guards, but I don't have to do it alone. I, I can join the resistance. Roberto, please, let me join the resistance. What have I to do with the resistance? But you need me. The resistance needs me. I am tired. I am strong. I fear nobody. And I have grown old. And I can help the resistance. Pity me, Roberto, pity me. Fighting resistance will meet tonight. Oh, thank you, Roberto. In your cafe. In my... Why not? It's the safest place in the city. That you, Pete? Yeah, Marge, it's me. Well, what about dinner? Uh, we'll have to send out. Oh, I see. I'm still being punished. Well, how can we be seen anywhere? I said you were indisposed. Well, why'd you say that? What else could I tell him? The truth. I don't care for his company. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Another cozy evening at home with the Millers, Pete, Marge. Oh, mm? you got a call from New York, Mr. Lowry. Oh, they're getting nervous. I don't have result number one as yet. You just won't understand why I refuse to see that man. Marge, Marge, it's, it's okay to have princes. As long as you don't practice them. Listen, we can really help these people. We, we, we'll drain swamps, cut down disease, raise food, create industry. Give them the strength to rise up and fight him. That's how to destroy Zaria. Well, I... Honey, I'm right. You know I'm right. Okay. Uh, now you're finally doing the right thing. You really do believe that my only mission is to keep you happy. I'm not a human being in my own right. Oh, for crying out loud, there you go again. What do you mean? There I go again. Marge. I have no thoughts, no feelings of my own. I'm even required to give up my own honeymoon because you don't have the backbone to stand up to a two-bit would-be Hitler who needs your machinery more than you need his business. I didn't say You've I would... that enough. Where are you going? I'm indisposed. <laughs> Roberto, will it be all right if I, if I say a few words? Yes. I, I will tell everyone who comes here tonight, never despair, never give up. Can I, can I say this at the meeting? Of course. You, you, you told everyone about the meeting to, to come here? Yes. Good. Well, when will the meeting begin? Now. I call the meeting to order. Who wishes the floor? But, but where is everyone? Here. You lied to me. You didn't tell the others. I couldn't tell the others. They are dead. Oh, but you said the resistance would meet tonight. The only organized resistance to Eduardo Guillermo Carlos Vicente Zorilla, known as the pig, is assembled in this room. My precious Pilar, the strong and the quick are now the weak and the dead. You stood by while that obscene swine destroyed the resistance. Now you call on it to avenge your son. Our son. Our... I would have acknowledged him. I would have married you. What kind of man marries a woman out of pity? What kind of woman denounces a man out of hate? Is there any new business? Any proposals? I propose... We kill the pig. There has already been violence enough. Other resolutions? None? Unless the chair hears to the contrary, this meeting stands adjourned. Good night, Pilar. Good night, 
Roberto. Good night, Siriaco. Remember, Siriaco, the little American girl who read me the letter? He looks like a pig, she said. Just like that. A skinny little girl looks at his picture and says, Pig. You know what makes her so wise, Siriaco? She thinks. Oh, there you have it. She and Roberto, thinkers. They would say... We have a problem. What is the most effective way to kill a pig? But what do they know about killing pigs? They are thinkers, philosophers, aristocrats. Oh, no, I know how to kill a pig. <laughs> tell me, Siriaco, tell me. Do I know how to kill a pig? There are probably many ways to kill a pig. But all of them have one basic requirement for success. It is necessary first to have your pig firmly in hand. Till now, this has been Mama Pilar's fundamental problem. However, we can depend on her to solve it when we return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. Marge Miller is a young newlywed who is having the first fight of her marriage. And permit us to say, it's a beaut. The reason may sound familiar. She refuses to socialize with her husband's client. It acquires deeper dimension when we consider that the client also happens to be the absolute dictator of a small nation. However, here comes Mama Pilar with her own score to settle. And does she bring salvation or disaster? No, no, I'm sorry, Pilar. It's out of the question. Why does the senora insist I wish to kill somebody? It's not just somebody. Zorilla. Me? Kill my leader? Oh, why else would you want to prepare a dinner for him? Oh, senora, I am growing old. Running a restaurant is too much for me. I, I'm looking for a job. And, and your husband's work, senora, requires you to entertain. You need a good cook. No, no, we don't entertain at all. Oh, but you should, senora. senora you you saw that. Sarge, if I let you cook a meal for old Zoria, <laughs> you'll bury a knife in him the minute he walks in. I will not. On, on my word of honor. Well, you'd spike his soup with arsenic. I will not. On my word of honor, I will do I nothing to... I believe you. But Pete would never buy it. Why not? Why not? Well, let's just say he's very nervous and upset right now. Ah, then you have a problem. Such a man is no good to a woman. Oh, no, no, no. We must relax him, restore his desire for romance. Amen. <laughs> now, suppose... Just suppose you said to your husband, eh, invite the leader here for dinner. <laughs> You're trying to sneak up on me. I said, just suppose. Well, what would he do? I guess he'd flip. Oh, oh but that must mean something good, eh? But, no, th there is no need to tell him I will cook the dinner until, well, until everyone arrives. And then it will be too late for him to object. How simple it is. Simple and deceitful. Why do you want to prepare a meal for Zoria? I have my reason. Sure. I want to help my husband do his job. But I can't very well have his client killed at my dining room table. Senora, this dinner will resurrect your marriage. It makes you think that my marriage needs to be... Oh. When a bride sits alone all afternoon, emptying glasses, filling ashtrays... <laughs> Pillar, pillar. Oh, no, 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 little one, don't cry. Oh, no, I promise you, this dinner will bring you both joy and happiness. It will restore your love, revive your honeymoon. But you promise, word of honor, you won't kill him here. My word of honor, I won't kill him anywhere. <laughs> Mr. Miller, now I understand. 
If my wife were as charming as yours, I would also keep her hidden. Oh, thank you, Your Excellency. Well, we want you to share an important event with us, Your Excellency. Uh, this is to be Marge's first home-cooked meal. Oh, now, dear, I didn't say I would cook the dinner myself. I, I hired some help. We even have music. Siriaco, play for us, please. Excellency, yes. your eating schedule. Oh, yes. Yes, Escobar. Uh, thank you. My dearest Mrs. Miller, summon the cook. Oh, certainly. Miller! Marge, what are you doing? Relax. And no matter what happens, remember, I love you. Your Excellency. Your name is Pilar? Yes, my leader. Hey, you are not from the city. I would know that hill country accent anywhere. Now, don't tell me. Puerto San Jorge. <laughs> I, I was born there, my leader. That's the real country. Those are the real people. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, my good Pilar, prepare for me... Uh, two boiled eggs, three minutes. Uh, you tell the time? Oh, yes, my leader. Three minutes, no more, no less. Tea with one teaspoon of skim milk. Toast. One dry slice thin. But, Your Excellency, we... I am on the, the most... strictest diet, my dear. I, oh, I... oh, forgive me. Please, forgive me. I, I didn't know... Pilar, you'll serve all of us eggs, tea, and toast. I forbid it! <laughs> no, no, you are, you are so sweet, sympathetic, sensitive, my dear, but, but I must forbid it. Pilar, you will serve your master, mistress, and Captain Escobar the prepared meal. Yes, my leader. But your excellency, we have no right to this enjoy something... This is something, something like... I must learn to live with. It's for the best. What is food? Merely a fuel. And with me, it was once a passion. And now that passion is spent, it is burned out completely. May I serve now, senora? Well, uh, yes, I, I suppose so. <laughs> the true passion stuck, that one. Where on earth did you find her? Oh, sir, you must never ask a lady where she finds her help. These must remain our little secrets. Oh! <laughs> oh, smell that! Oh, smell that! I have not seen beef marinated San Jorge style in years. Oh, Pilar, you are a genius. Oh, thank you, my leader. Yeah, I uh, d don't know if I'm hungry. I command you to eat. But we have no right to enjoy gourmet cooking while you My have dear, the... my dear, this is not gourmet cooking. This is hill country cooking. Oh, I was weaned on it. That, that, that meat before you. Let me tell you how that divine fragrance and flavor is achieved. The meat is first soaked in specially spiced wine and then marinated in a special spice and garlic sauce. The exact recipe is a secret handed down from mother to daughter. But, Your Excellency, we have no right to do this to you. We should send it back to the kitchen. No, no, I curb my passions. And so enjoy yourselves. I command you to enjoy yourselves. My leader, your eggs, tea, and toast. Thank you, my dear Pilar. Thank you. There. There you are. See? We'll see how, how quickly I have fueled my engine. Half a dozen bites, a couple of swallows, and I am done. You, you have scarcely begun. You will fritter away your lives at the table. Whereas I, I, I shall have endless hours free for work, for study, and for, uh, and for, uh, and, um, oh, well, oh, well, I, I don't see how, just perhaps the, the tiniest piece of that meat could, uh, could do me any real harm. Pilar. Yes, my leader. Oh, let go of her arm, Escobar. Oh, my leader, I am only doing my duty. You deserve a decoration. Make note of it. Now, Pilar, uh, that piece, that... <laughs> and then that one. Oh, fine, fine. Splendid. Oh, oh. Oh, this is, this is every bit the way I, I remember. Oh, this, this is the, the food of the gods. 
God's bimar. My leader? A special spice wine is always served with this. Oh, I have it here, my leader. <laughs> yes, yes, I... This is... Oh, good, I'm... Or I'm renewing myself. More meat, Pilar. Where does he put it, Pete? Where? I don't know. Your Excellency, your diet. You shouldn't eat this much in a week, a, a month. Shut up, Pilar. Uh, yes, my leader. My glass is empty. My plate's empty. Oh. Oh. oh, this is heavenly. Where has this shining light been hidden? Pilar, more meat. More of everything. Oh, you... You work for these good people, Pilar. Yes, um, my leader. And when they go home... Oh, well, I mm-hmm. must find another place to cook. No, no, no. I... I must eat no more. I have eaten too much. I should have eaten nothing. Take it away, Pilar. Remove everything. I must not eat no more. I must not. My, 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 my doctor is right. Your doctor lies. Huh? Oh, what have you said? Oh, oh, please, my leader. I meant no harm. All my life I, I have prepared food. It never hurt anyone. How can a doctor blame food? Yes, my kind Pilar. Oh, all the men in my family, my father, my brothers, my son, they always ate what I cooked. Not one was ever sick. My leader, this is food. This is life. I, it was so good. So good. I... My leader, who ever heard of doctors at the hill country? My father died at 95. My father was drowned at 86. He was trying to swim the San Jorge River to visit the most beautiful widow in the province. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Miller, Mrs. Miller. Y- y- yes, sir. Uh, you have made me aware of something I seem to have forgotten. My roots. I have lost them. But I find them here. Just in time. Yes. Yes, I shall be nourished by the food of my peasant ancestors. Escobar, dismiss that quack, Dr. Suarez. But, Your Excellency... Mr. Miller, you... why have you come to this country? To make your fortune, eh? Well... Your fortune is made. Create, build, construct, send me engineers, teachers, technicians, designers. Have the necessary papers ready for signature in the morning. Your, your Excellency. Uh, see? You are successful beyond your wildest dreams. Thank, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, thank me by giving me this woman, Pilar. Would you like to live in the palace? Oh, <laughs> my leader, what... What does a peasant woman know at a palace? The kitchen. You shall rule over the kitchen. I? Yes. Oh, me? To, to cook for my leader? Oh, but I, I am only a plain peasant woman. Escobar, it was a plot. A plot, Excellency? A clever plan to kill me. How? They would starve me to death. Oh. Pilar. Is there more meat? Oh, yes, my leader. <laughs> of course, I have... I have learned a lesson, even from my enemies. Moderation. I shall enjoy good food, but in, in moderation. Uh, and what does my leader desire for, for his breakfast? <laughs> Woman, do, do I solicit your advice on the training of troops, the administration of justice... Do not consult me. Prepare what you choose. Is there dessert? Of course, my leader. I'll go and help Pilar serve. Pilar. See, I gave you my word of honor. But you are going to kill him. You see that man. He can't help himself. Neither can a pig. It's the nature of the animal. But Pilar. Look at him. A knife. A bullet. A few grains of poison. Much too swift, much too merciful. No, this is better. I have seen swine stuffed like him. They die slowly, badly, in agony. Much better. Oh, be happy, senora. I have kept my word. And you have won your husband again. Pilar, the dessert. Time once again to stuff the pig. Coming, my leader. We have a simple sweet. A, a, a simple sweet? Yes, senor. We call it the Mountain of San Jorge. Whipped cream, ice cream, chocolate, preserves, nuts, fruit. <laughs> oh, 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 Pilar, Pilar. Mm. Mm. 
My dear good friends, you you have renewed my life. Oh, your slave, my leader. Escobar, have Dr. Suarez shot at once. There is plenty more in the kitchen, my leader. Oh, I, I can hardly wait for breakfast. <laughs> what shall we have, Pilar? Oh, you <laughs> said for me to <laughs> surprise you. Oh, you, will, you will serve me always, Pilar. Say, say you do, you will serve me always. You are my leader. I will serve you to the death. As some people might say, what a way to go. But this is something the mama pillars of the world understand. If you can't get to a man's heart with a knife, another way, and a better way, is to get there through his stomach. I shall return shortly. it said, the pen is mightier than the sword. This sentiment was written by a man and can be dismissed as male chauvinist propaganda. What every woman knows is that mightier than the pen or the sword is a knife and the fork. If you don't believe it, just ask Mama Pilar. Our cast included Bryna Rayburn, Marion Seldes, Jack Grimes, Leon Janney, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sign Off, the Sinus Medicines. Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... (laughs) 